ECMO popular in adult respiratory cases. Believe me, when we are uh, uh, doing MBBS, you can hardly, in any ICU, you can hardly see any young patient or any age of the 40 patients with a white out lung, which you are seeing after 20 years in every ICU. If you see, if you think of your ICU, you will see at least out of 10 bed, one patient is there where the lung is not working, is a young patient, is having acute kind of pneumonia because of viral pneumonia and all these things. So this art has, uh, uh, because of this uh, viral pneumonia has come up in your ICU, the role of ECMO has been expanded like anything. And this trial actually uh, opened the, uh, this, this fantastic modality as a life saving because after ventilation, if you are not being able to maintain the oxygenation, there is no way you can make them uh, recovered. So again, the, uh, there is another trial also, uh, H1N1 trial which came out and a lot of trials after that proved a lot of, so this is a very landmark article in uh, 2012 which actually placed your uh, ECMO in the last part of the ARDS as a established modality of your treatment. So uh, we are now uh, quite uh, uh, familiar enough that and also confident enough to practice ECMO as a modality of ARDS. So with that thing, I'm just hand over uh, the initial lectures to uh, Dr. Hidok. Uh, Hidok, what's your name? Who is? So he will give an overview of your uh, configurations, the indications where they are using. Then we'll come back with some cases. Uh, we'll make it a bit interactive after that because this is a uh, first introduction I have given for five minutes. And then he will tell about the indications and the uh, configurations we are using. Thank you very much, Dr. Arpon. He is our past IGMO president, IGMO Society of India, and national and international delegates. Thank you very much. Now I request. Dr. Hirok Subra Mojumdar, Consultant Critical Care, IGMO Physician and Cardiac Anesthesiologist, Medical Super Specialty Hospital. His speech on interaction type, indication, and physiology. Sir, please. Just a minute. Very good morning to my respected seniors, my colleagues and uh, dear juniors, and welcome to this ECMO workshop. Now, ECMO, historically, it was first used successfully in 1971 by Dr. J.D. Hill. It was used on a young cyclist who suffered from acute respiratory distress syndrome for following a trauma. Now, since then, ECMO has been uh, used uh, gradually. Uh, multiple studies have been done in the initial uh, um, stages, some of the studies they were in for uh, ECMO, some actually showed that uh, um, it didn't cause uh, much of uh, change in the patient outcome. However, as the technology has progressed, ECMO has gradually established itself as a uh, advanced form of uh, uh, cardiorespiratory life support when rest of the uh, measures are not working. The real boost in the usage of ECMO actually happened in the 2009 during H1N1 flu when both uh, the, the number of cases and the number of centers actually increased worldwide. More recently, during the COVID pandemic, we have found the utility of ECMO more um, in a hand-to-hand -hand basis, and uh, not only the, um, around the world, but the uh, number of ECMO cases as well as ECMO centers has increased in the India as well. Now, this is the ELSO registry. As we can see that with each passing year, the number of ECMO cases and the uh, number of centers has increased. Not only the cases has increased, but uh, overall the outcome of the ECMO has gradually improved as well. So it is no more a helpless attempt to just delay the death. Rather, ECMO has established its, uh, itself as kind of a last ray of hope when 
uh, all the rest of the things are not working. So this is, in, in the simplest form, this is the uh, basic of our problem. See, uh, the function of our heart and lungs is to ensure proper tissue perfusion and tissue oxygenation. So whenever there is any dysfunction, either in the lungs or heart, either in, um, both simultaneously or in an isolated manner, the main thing that is hampered is the tissue uh, oxygenation and tissue hypoxia is the main problem. So that is where the ECMO steps in. So what is ECMO? Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation is the use of extracorporeal real, that is the outside of the body, circulation and gaseous exchange to provide temporary life support to patients with reversible pulmonary and cardiac failure. So ECMO is a temporary support and it works only when the pathology is reversible or when we are planning for transplant. So to put in the simplest form, this is what we do in the ECMO. We drain the blood from a major vein of the patient. We pass it through a membrane gaseous exchange by a pump. Then we return the blood to a large vein or the artery. Okay. So the go main goal of the ECMO is to ensure that the tissues have enough oxygen. Obviously, it doesn't heal the heart or the lungs, but it just gives the time uh, to the organs so that they can recover. So, um, Dr. Arpan has already said this, that ECMO, it serves as a bridging of the therapy. In most favorable condition, when the ECMO is actually, uh, um, in, in, in most of the cases, ECMO actually buys the time uh, for the organs and the patient to recover. If the patient is not recovering, in that case, it, uh, it gives us the time to take the proper decision to take the next step. Or in some of the patients who are suitable uh, for organ transplant or who are, say, uh, mm, we are planning to put them on ventricular uh, assist device and all, in those patients, unless that definitive treatment is being done, ECMO buys us the time and keeps the patient alive. So this is the, the indication of ECMO is basically either the cardiac failure or in the respiratory failure or when there is combined. Based upon the indication, the types of ECMO is determined. It, uh, broadly, it is either veno-arterial or in the veno-venous form. In the veno-arterial form, we drain the blood from a large vein of the um, um, patient, pass it to the membrane oxygenator, and we return the blood to the arterial system. So by uh, returning the blood to the arterial system, we are maintaining the organ perfusion of the patient when the heart is not functioning properly. And while returning the blood, we are oxygenating it, so we are also doing the function of the lungs. Whereas in the venovenous ECMO, we take the blood out from the venous system, oxygenate it, and we return it to the venous system only. So venovenous system is only for the respiratory support, whereas veno-arterial system, although it is principally used for the cardiac support, but it does provide uh, pulmonary support as well. There are also uh, multiple other configurations of, of ECMO, VAV, VVA, VVV. This uh, terminologies are based upon, say, like in VAV, the drainage site is from the vein, and we return the blood both in the arterial limb and to the another venous limb. When we use two drainage cannula from the vein and return the blood in an arterial site, it is called the VV ECMO. VVV is completely venous ECMO when we are draining the blood from two uh, uh, venous site and returning it to the uh, single vein. And also, when we are only planning to take out the carbon dioxide, there are multiple configurations of extracorporeal carbon dioxide removal as well. Now, before we are planning to put a patient on ECMO, the most important thing that we should consider is what is the future, that is likelihood of organ recovery. That is the first most thing, because whatever advanced form of life support the ECMO is, it is not going to help in the primary recovery of the organ. So, Li likelihood of organ recovery is to be considered uh, before putting a patient on ECMO. There are multiple other uh, issues which, when present, we should think twice before initiating the ECMO. Like if there is multi-organ dysfunction, patient with disseminated malignancy, advanced stage was initially uh, um, thought of a relatively contraindication, but to be very frank, nowadays we uh, use ECMO on aged patient as well, and uh, it has been used uh, successfully. Patient with known severe brain injury in whose the recovery of heart or lungs is not going to um, bring any change to the outcome, we should be cautious uh, while giving ECMO to them. 
unwitnessed cardiac arrest when there is has been uh, ROSC, but uh, mm, uh, it is not quite sure that how long uh, there was loss of spontaneous circulation. Is mm, this patient think uh, we uh, uh, it is better to avoid the ECMO? And when there are some technical issues like in the aortic pathology, if there if there is any aortic dissection or indication of venovenous ECMO is acute respiratory distress syndrome. It can be of because of multiple uh, um, causes. It can be either pneumonia for bacterial or viral, with aspiration syndromes, alveolar proteinosis, anything. Then difficult or impossible in, in patients which uh, there is difficult or impossible to maintain the airway ventilation, such as say a patient is undergoing thoracic surgery or avic induction of anesthesia severely uh, compromised airway, restriction of airway mass. See, in all these conditions, mm -hmm. establishing an airway and establishing a ventilation is difficult. So sometimes uh, it is safer to put the patient on venovenous ECMO first. You ensure that the oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal, that part has been taken care of. Then you proceed with the planned uh, um, procedure. Okay. Uh, VV ECMO is used to provide lung rest in large bronchopleural fistulas, patient suffering from pulmonary contusion, smoke or chemical inhalation, in drowning patients. Lung transplant, VV ECMO is of paramount importance. It can act as a bridge to lung transplant. You can put the patient on uh, VV ECMO unless we are getting the organ. Uh, in the intraoperatively, if there is any, any problem, it can always be supported by VV ECMO. And even the post transplant, if patient is having any primary graft failure, VV ECMO will be established. And there are multiple other indications as well, such as respiratory uh, refractory bronchospasm, pulmonary hemorrhage or hemoptysis or poisoning. Uh, multiple tropical diseases are there, such as dengue, malaria, TB, typhus fever, legionella, and obviously H1N1 and COVID, in which uh, um, uh, refractory a uh, ARDS has, uh, has been found and they have been successfully treated with VV ECMO. Now, before putting a patient on ECMO, we'll have to first assess what is the, whether that patient actually needs ECMO or not. Now, there are some scoring systems to help us to achieve that goal. Most commonly used is the MARIA score when we are assessing a patient uh, on ARDS. There are four parameters which are used. One is PF ratio. Then in the chest X-ray, we see uh, uh, the number of quadrants that are involved, PEEP and compliance. See, as the uh, condition of the lungs worsen, our PF ratio decreases. Chest X-ray gets worsened and more and more quadrants of the lungs are involved. Requirement of PEEP is further increased and obviously uh, the compliance of lung worsens. So any patient having MARI score of more than 3 should be considered for venovenous support. Uh, Eolia criteria is another uh, way by which we can assess the requirement of VV ECMO. It takes into consideration the hypoxia and hypercarbia. Now if there is a PF ratio of less than 50, for more than three hours or less than 80 for more than six hours in a patient who has been uh, um, supported by mechanical ventilation with optimum settings with more than 80% of FiO2, rescue maneuver, uh, maneuvers like venovenous ECMO should be considered. Or if there is hypercapnia with, P uh, with PSEO2 more than 60 millimeters of mercury for more than six hours with uh, uh, adequate ventilatory settings, in uh, those patients will also need venovenous support. Uh, there is uh, also guidelines for this purpose as well, which is more or less similar to the criteria that mentioned before. Venoarterial ECMO, the main indication is cardiogenic shock. It is, venoarterial ECMO is a form of mechanical circulatory support, forms of mechanical circulatory support of which VA ECMO is a chief one. So cardiogenic shock, commonly uh, it results from acute myocardial infarction or some myocarditis, post uh, uh, cardio tummy and during cardiac surgery patients, if we are not being able to come off the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, we can put the patient on uh, VA ECMO. Uh, patients who are uh, not recovering uh, uh, from heart failure, end stage heart failure, in those patients, uh, ECMO can act as a bridge to transplant or bridge to LVAD. Post heart transplant, if there is any dysfunction or uh, we are again planning to put the patient on LVAD, it can be supported on VA ECMO. Hypothermic shock. Refractory arrhythmias when it's not working, uh, it is better to put the patient on VA ECMO, give the heart rest, and then they gradually recover. We have done it multiple times in our center. Uh, um, backup in uh, high risk cardiac intervention. This we have done, say a patient is having severely um, um, uh, low 
e ejection fraction and the patient is in plan for um, primary angioplasty. In those patients, to ensure the safety, you first put the patient on VA ECMO, then you proceed with the uh, definite procedure. Postpartum or acute cardiomyopathy, drug intoxication, sepsis, trauma, massive pulmonary embolism, endocrine emergency, or the eCPR. When RSC is not being achieved in spite of uh, um, CPR, uh, um, uh, uh, we put the patient on uh, uh, VA ECMO and give the heart time to recover. Now, refractory cardiogenic shock such as uh, um, systolic uh, blood pressure less than 90 millimeter of mercury, less than 30 ml of furin output, lactate is rising, uh, mixed saturation is less than 60, and patient is having altered uh, consciousness. When we have done optimum management and we are not getting any uh, result, with a potential reversible cause or surgically correctable cause, we should always think of renal arterial ECMO. Now, according to ELSO guidelines, any patient who is having uh, refractory cardiogenic shock um, from a reversible uh, cardiocircularity uh, collapse or the patients who have been planned to undergo left ventricular access device or transplantation, if they are having cardiogenic shock it is better to initiate the VA uh, ECMO within first six hours of its occurrence. See, timing is important because whenever a patient is in the shock, in the initial stage, there is hemodynamic instability, which if not get corrected, ultimately leads to hemometabolic instability. Once the metabolic instability sets in, the efficacy of this mechanical circulatory support is reduced. So timing is very important. If the ECMO is indicated, it is, it is better to initiate early. Now, if we grade the, uh, um, uh, the heart failure in the intermediate stages, ECMO is indicated in the uh, um, class 1 and class 2, when there is uh, cash and burn shock or when there is non-improvement in spite of proper anotropic support. Now, uh, there are con uh, like all the modalities, there are some contraindications on venous arterial ECMO as well, such as when the cardiac recovery is unlikely and the patient is not suitable to undergo LVAD uh, or um, the transplant. In patient with severe irreversible non-cardiac uh, organ damage, we are just saving the heart is not going to save the patient. In aortic valve uh, pathologies or in there is um, aortic dissection, if in patients who have severe neurologic impairment uh, and uh, patient with severe uh, immunologic diseases and liver cirrhosis, in these patients, where arterial ECMO is better avoided. Now, so this uh, equation we have been studying uh, uh, since, the early days, uh, since the early days of our medical schools, but this is the most important equation in our day-to-day -day practice. See, just to brush up, the rate of oxygen delivery to our body, it is determined by the uh, oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and the cardiac output. Now, most of the oxygen that is carried in our blood, it is carried by the bound to hemoglobin. One gram of hemoglobin, it uh, binds with the 1.3 ml of oxygen. S and as you can see that every minimum portion of oxygen is actually carried in the dissolved form. So whatever may be the high value of the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, uh, the amount of oxygen that is carried by the uh, increased partial pressure will not be enough unless this uh, hem hemoglobin saturation is adequate. Now, what happens in a normal functioning lungs and heart, say? Uh, a patient is uh, having normally cardiac function, normal pulmonary function. In those patients, when a blood is leaving the uh, le left ventricle with a, hemoglobin uh, with a hemoglobin concentration of 15 gram per dl and 100% oxygen saturation, each ml of blood actually contains 20 ml of uh, um, uh, 20 ml of oxygen. Now, if we multiply this with the cardiac uh, index of cardiac output, we get the oxygen uh, delivery of around 600 ml per minute per meter square. Whereas in resting condition, the oxygen consumption of the body is hardly 120 ml per minute per meter square. So, uh, the oxygen reserve of our body is, is actually more than five, is um, almost five times than the oxygen requirement. Oxygen content of the blood and oxygen saturation two are not same thing. See in this uh, figure, uh, that's what we have tried to show. That a venous blood of 70% saturation will contain more oxygen than the arterial blood with 100% saturation if the hemoglobin level is less than 7.5. So not only the oxygen saturation of the blood, it is the total oxygen content that is more important. 
Now what happens in our body is just like we said that when we are in the resting state the delivered oxygen is almost five times than the required oxygen. As the oxygen requirement increases we keep on taking up the oxygen from the reserved one which is reflected by the gradual drop in the venous oxygen saturation. Once the uh, requirement of oxygen increases so much that the delivered oxygen is not more than twice of the required oxygen that is when the DO2 by VO2 ratio is less than 2 that is when the anaerobic metabolism starts and the lactic acidosis uh, starts in our body. So our um, target is to uh, ensure that uh, anaerobic metabolism uh, does not set in and uh, um, we should be able to maintain the DO2 and VO2 ratio more than 2. Now what is happening in the membrane oxygenator? See, it is a uh, hollow fiber membrane. Uh, mm, uh, the gases or the oxygen, it is actually passed through the lumen of the hollow fibers and the spaces in between the uh, fibers is the uh, area through where the blood is passed, okay. So, and just like in our normal alveolus in the uh, hollow fiber membrane also, the gaseous exchange happens according to the concentration gradient of the gases and it follows the diffusion, uh, the principle of diffusion. But obviously the native lung and the extracorporeal membrane is not same. Uh, uh, what happens in the normal alveolar capillary is, it is thickness is almost uh, 10 micron. So, only one file of RBC is passing through the alveolar capillary. Also, the interface between the alveolar gas and the uh, R R RBCs in the lungs is just two cell and, um, thick. Uh, the lining of the alveolar capillary endothelium and the lining of the uh, alveolar epithelium. Whereas, what is happening in the membrane lung is the spaces in, in between the hollow fibers is almost 30 micron thick. So, uh, instead of one file of R, uh, uh, instead of one file of RBC, there is a layer of blood that is passing in in between the hollow hollow, hollow fibers. So there is, is one layer of the RBC which remains in close proximity to the membrane. The the layer which gets uh, saturated rather quickly that is the barrier layer, where as the uh, um, layer of the R, uh, R, R, RBCs as as they come more far away from the membrane it takes more time for those RBCs to get saturated. So, adequate transit time is needed for the blood while it is passing through the uh, hollow fiber membrane for proper oxygenation. Uh, that is where the rated flow actually comes. Rated flow is the flow in which if we are passing a 70 percent saturated venous blood through the, uh, the, the, the through an oxygenator, it will come out having 95 percent of saturation. Mem uh, membrane oxygenators of the ECMO machine, they are selected based upon their rated flow. So the gaseous exchange of the ECMO or the oxygenation, it depends on pump flow, uh, fraction of the delivered oxygen, it, it corroborates to the FiO2 of the ventilator, hemoglobin concentration of the blood, saturation of the venous blood that is going inside the uh, mm, uh, membrane lung as well as the membrane surface area. Carbon dioxide removal, it just depends on the sweep gas flow only. So, you see this is uh, an, uh, another concept. If we subtract the oxygen content of the venous blood that is going inside the membrane from the oxygen content of the blood that is coming outside the membrane, we get the amount of oxygen that we are delivering uh, the, by the membrane oxygenator. The ultimately oxygen con uh, concentration of the um, patient's uh, body will be determined by the oxygen content of the blood that is coming out from the membrane and the oxygen content of the venous blood that is not going um, uh, through the ECMO circulation. So the PO2 is determined by the mixing effect of the oxygenated blood. Let me explain it to you. Say a patient is having a cardiac output of 6 liter. So venous return will be 6 liter per minute and we are giving a flow of say, 4 liter per minute in the ECMO. So what will happen is that 4 liter of the blood, that, that 4 liter of the venous return which is passing through the uh, um, membrane oxygenator will return to the RA with full uh, 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 containing the high amount of the oxygen. Whereas the rest of the 2 liter of the blood which is, by, uh, uh, which is not included in the uh, ECMO circulation, it will return in the RA 
in the same manner. And if the lung is not functioning, then the ultimately oxygen content that we are getting in the patient's body will be the resultant of the mixture of the blood that is coming from the ECMO and the native circulation of the patient. Carbon dioxide exchange uh, is mainly uh, the, the function of the amount of the sweep gas that we are um, providing in the membrane oxygenator. And carbon dioxide exchange is, more, more, is much more efficient than the oxygen because of its solubility. Now, uh, when we are talking about venoatrial ECMO, the concept of recirculation always comes. Uh, it is a phenomenon which happens when we have put the drainage cannula and the return cannula in too much close proximity. So what happens is that the oxygenated blood uh, from the ECMO machine, which is returned to the patient's body, some amount of that blood is getting sucked back to the ECMO circuit directly. So what it does is it reduces the efficacy of the ECMO circuit. There is a formula to calculate the recirculation. It is the oxygen saturation of the uh, um, blood, which is uh, pre-membrane minus the venous saturation of the patient divided by post-membrane blood oxygen saturation minus the uh, venous uh, saturation of the patient. Recirculation up to 30% is allowable. If it is more than that, then it will uh, act itself, uh, uh, act as a cause of um, uh, desaturation on ECMO. Now, in the venoatrial ECMO, just like as uh, we have mentioned, that we, we are taking the blood from the uh, venous uh, system, pumping it uh, through the membrane oxygenator, and, and we are returning it to the arterial system. So by returning it to the arterial system, what we are doing is we are ensuring that the organ perfusion is maintained when our heart is not functioning. But while doing that, although the tissue perfusion is maintained, we are increasing the afterload of the heart. So in venoatrial ECMO, there is always a chance of LV distension. Okay, so now these are the uh, uh, changes that happen uh, when we are putting a patient on venoatrial ECMO. Right ventricular preload, it is reduced, obviously, because we are, uh, we are draining the blood directly. So direct drainage from the RA and by the effect of cardiopulmonary bypass. Right ventricular afterload, uh, the effect is unpredictable because it is uh, controlled by the multiple factors such as pulmonary uh, vascular resistance, preload and afterload of the LV, vasopressors and all. Left ventricular preload is obviously decreased by the, um, uh, is decreased when we are put, um, putting a patient on venoatrial ECMO uh, as there is reduced pulmonary blood flow by the carbondiopulmonary bypass, so LV preload is reduced. LV afterload, however, is increased because there is increased, uh, increased mean arterial pressure, it is a continuous flow and we are sending the flow in the opposite direction in which the heart is pumping. So, distended LV is a problem in the venoatrial ECMO which should always be uh, kept in mind while we are putting the patient on ECMO. Causes are increased afterload, the uh, reduced contractility and in some cases even increased preload. See, so this is the picture of a patient when we have put the patient on venoatrial ECMO in the initial stages. Uh, as you can see that the cardiac ejections are not there. So, when putting the patient on venoatrial ECMO, instead of uh, looking the systolic pressure on diastolic pressure, it is the pulse pressure that we always keep in mind. Pulse pressure of 20 or more is acceptable and uh, because that actually means that in spite of poor function, the heart is still ejecting, the aortic valve is still opening. Now, when talking about venoatrial ECMO, uh, Harlequin syndrome is a concept which we uh, should be familiar with. See, what happens is, in the initial stage, when the patient is put on venoatrial ECMO, the heart is not functioning. The more, uh, more or less the organ perfusion is uh, uh, ensured by the ECMO itself. But as the heart starts improving, as the heart starts ejecting the blood, if the uh, condition of the lung is not good, then the upper part of the body, that means the coronaries and circulation of the uh, um, left arm, that will be ensured by the native uh, ejection, uh, 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 that will be ensured by the ejection from the native circulation only. So there may uh, occur a condition in which the upper part of the body, the brain and the coronaries, they are getting relatively deoxygenated blood the rest uh, part of the body, they are getting the properly oxygenated blood from the ECMO. How to manage the Harlequin syndrome? We will uh, come in the next lectures. Okay, now uh, uh, something about this ECMO pump flow, as we all know, this is a centrifugal pump. So the flow is non-pulsatile and the flow is not constant. ECMO flow, it depends on the preload and afterload of the patient and the system. 
the pump flow each uh, depends on the pump pressure uh, length of the tubing and the canular diameter if the length of the tubing is too much then the resistance will increase and we will not be able to generate adequate amount of flow likewise increasing the canular uh, diameter it reduces the uh, resistance of the entire system and helps to increase the flow so while putting a patient on ecmo it is important that we try to maintain the length of the uh, circuit as low as possible to um, uh, ensure the adequate accuracy of the system and finally uh, extracorporeal system it uh, al always increases the chance of systemic inflammatory response syndrome because the ECMO circuit and the membrane oxygenator they are not endothelium coated so there is chances of uh, um, SARS reaction but on the other hand uh, it pr facilitates the lung protective ventilation it reduce it gives myocardial uh, rest and improve the organ perfusion so by that means it reduces the systemic inflammation so it is the balance between the two things so take home message is firstly ECMO is a supportive measure it's not a curative one the underlying pathology has to resolve for the positive outcome gaseous exchange is in, uh, in membrane is dependent on the concentration gradient of the gases it follows the same uh, principle of the diffusion like the alveolus oxygen delivery is dependent on ECMO flow and hemoglobin carbon dioxide washout is dependent on sweet glass blood flow uh, sorry uh, blood flow through centrifugal pump is dependent on preload and the afterload. Be aware of recirculation when the patient is of venovenous ECMO and always aware of LV distension when the patient on venoatrial ECMO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hirok. Now we proceed to our next session, very interactive session. And again, speech by Dr. Orpon Chakraborty. Management of VV ICMO, a case discussion, and management of VV ICMO, a case discussion. So uh, uh, this uh, session, we have actually uh, will not concentrate on the slides. We'll um, keep it bit interactive because after from this uh, time onwards, it will be a workshop kind of thing uh, rather than uh, some, uh, podium presentation. So uh, I have chosen two cases which we have done recently, and we will just show the pictures, and uh, you people will tell me where the way we should uh, go forward because as Hirok uh, has been, uh, uh, he has done uh, 
um, the indications and the mainly the elaboration how we practice ECMO as an uh, introduction. So we will continue to interact because uh, uh, we know a lot of theories, but uh, practically how we do this, uh, we have to learn. So uh, starting a case, uh, this was a patient who got shifted from a uh, hospital, a peripheral hospital, um, uh, after five days of ventilation, uh, five days of uh, admission and the ventilation after, uh, for 36 hours and uh, she got prone over there and uh, the PO2 was around 49 with 100% oxygenation and you can see the x-ray here and the uh, ventilator patterns. You can see the ventilation and uh, the x-ray over here and uh, this was the thing when she got prone and uh, got shifted to us. Now uh, her PO2 was 49 when we received her and she was around 100 kg. So we uh, thought uh, we have to put her on ECMO. Now to put her on ECMO you need to uh, assess few things. We, whenever a patient, this kind of patient comes, uh, we calculate the MARE score for ARDS, okay, for the VB presentation. You know cal, uh, how many, there are four components of MARE score over here and that is uh, the how many quadrants of the lung got involved, how uh, is the compliance of the lung, how much is the PEEP is there, and how much is your PO2 FiO2 ratio is there. So we calculate the MARE score, you can see on your uh, mobile uh, how if you calculate them, uh, it comes around either it is less than 3 or more than 3. Uh, uh, there. So there is a cutoff mark of 3, okay. When it comes below 3, we uh, there is a room for conservative management. So what we do when it comes less than three and the patient is shifted to us or a patient is uh, referred to us for an ECMO, we told the relatives that we are continuing the conservative management or the proning, but if uh, things deteriorate further and the score goes up more than three, be prepared for an ECMO because ECMO is a costly thing and you have to initially told the relatives that this is the way we should work and we will see for 6 hours, 12 hours, if it, is, does, it doesn't work then we will. If it is, the initial score is 3, we start speaking to the relatives regarding the counseling, regarding the ECMO. So these four components you have to keep in mind, the PO to FI to ratio, the how many quadrants of your chest lung is involved, how much is your uh, compliance of the lung which is uh, in the ventilator setting and what is the PF ratio. Now with that thing this patient was put on ECMO. Now uh, anybody of you please tell me uh, what should be, she is a 42 year old female and uh, I want to put her on venovenous ECMO. The, uh, are you fine with the, uh, I am putting on venovenous ECMO, that is for sure. Why sir, you please tell me. Why you want to put her on venovenous ECMO?
annotation with the you know. Uh, so as we have told, the ECMO is all about two pipes. One is for the drainage and one is for the return. So what we have done, we did cannulate the IVC through the femoral root. And you can see the cannula is in the IVC. Okay. It has gone through the puncture in the femorals and it has gone right up to the intrahepatic IVC just below the IVC enters the right atrium. You can see? All of you can see? The visual impact as we made it. Okay. So it is the drainage cannula. We have to go. It is draining the blue blood. Okay. Now this thing is coming to the say, oxygenator or the pump. Okay. Then we are pushing the red blood again. As you have told, we can use it. Jugular The jugular we have pushed just uh, beyond RA or sub above, above the RA. Above the RA is better. Uh, I will tell you why we have kept it in the RA. So this is the this is the configuration of the femoral jugular can be Okay, got it? So we will uh, on hands on we will show you what are the cannulas, how we do cannulate and all this. But just look at this. For we have cannulated R on femoral jugular Now suppose there is a uh, neck line or a neck is not being uh, able to uh, uh, take the cannula in the neck. So do we have any more option for cannulating uh, VDA2 to her? Single, 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 single cannulation and the femorofemoral is the common. Now if you want to cannulate the femorofemoral, what you have to do? So we don't have a femoral cannula. If we want to cannulate her femorofemoral, okay, femoral will be the drainage and femoral will be the return. So we have to cannulate the both femorals. Okay. Now you can see that we have cannulated here both femorals. What we have done, which is the drainage cannula, which is the return cannula? Recirculation most of the time happens when the femoral femoral venovenous ECMO because the proximity of the cannulas are uh, uh, much more. Okay, femoral jugular have the connected gap maintained with the body, femoral femoral like it's not say chances. So, as much as possible, I mean, return cannula take a RIT. So, just uh, look at this. This is the femoral femoral cannulation, venovenous uh, cannulation. Okay. No, what we okay, now what we are using, how we, uh, uh, we ensure that there is a cannula is in the fluoroscopy won't get it in the, uh, because you are doing it in the ICU. Amra ki kochi? Amra? USG machine used to. <coughs> USG is the first cannula when you push it, will keep it at the level of your intrahepatic IVC. The IVC view will tell you the where is the cannula position. Okay, that will show slowly. And after that, the second cannula, the guide wire, we will track up to the right atrium and will push as much as possible in the right atrium. If it goes in the SVC also, there is no problem. Because we have to keep a duto end at a 10 centimeter minimum gap to prevent the recirculation. Got the point? So we do use the USG or the eco machine to uh, point of care. Imaging during the calculation, not the fluoroscope. After that, we check the X ray to recount from the position. Got it? So, this is the way we calculate for VDA. Any, uh, any more questions uh, regarding calculation? They will uh, again take it in our calculation session. Any questions? Any doubts? 
patient was put on ECMO, what we see, what we have done, we came to the rest ventilator setting. Okay, we have just came, it was almost 100 kg female, so we just given this 350 ml of lateral volume and peak we have kept around 10 and we are slowly reducing the FiO2. Uh, now this 50 will come down to 30 to 40 and the rate is almost, we kept around 12 to 14. So this is the way we uh, rest the lung after putting the patient on VBA. And what is this? This is the console which is showing how much flow we are giving to the patient. Now, the, as Hirav has told, how much flow should be uh, uh, the ideal flow for him or her. If her cardiac output is 5 meters, if I think, okay, so what should be the flow of venovena uh, uh, sigmo to uh, maintain the oxygenation? Yeah. So at least this has to be 60, 60 percent or more. Okay. So if it's five liters, you should at least target a three liter of flow. Okay. If not more. Okay. Three, three point five, four, four point five, whatever you want, but not less than three. What will happen then? If it is less than three, the oxidation will not happen because the whole thing is dependent on your cardiac output. How much of your cardiac output is going to the going to the oxygenator. Okay, so now the patient is having two lungs. One is his native lung and one is your oxygenator, which is the uh, echo thing. Now, your target is to maximally cross the, of your cardiac output through the ECMO thing because that will give a 100% oxygen. The, if you allow to pass at least one liter of cardiac output through your native lung, which is not participating in any kind of oxygenation, it will drop down your effect of this ECMO. So at least more than 60 to 70 percent of flow has to go through the uh, your ECMO oxygen. So that idea is clear? The idea is clear. A lot of jargons will play. 
But basic idea you have to clear because Venovera Sekou is very basic. You know why the Venovera Sekou works, you have to keep in mind. This time, whenever we put the patient on VV ECMO, patient is having two lungs. One is disease lung, one is very good lungs. Our plan, our management will be maximum cardiac output should go through the oxygen level. So that the hit 100% oxygenates and lung acts as a, only a passage of thing. It is not participating in oxygenation. So the blood which is which you are pushing back in your right atria is actually going to the left side of the lung, crossing uh, left side of the body, crossing the lung. Lung is just a passive. It is not contributing any kind of oxygenation if you are not allowing any native cardiac output to go through your uh, lung itself. So, more the ECMO flow, more will be the patient's improvement in the PO2 and the saturation. So, is this clear? Because this is the basic of the ECMO where we are practicing. Okay, people always ask me if you take the blood from the venous side and pushing it to the venous side, how it is going to help? If any, clear Got the point? We push the patient. I mean, the blood push the arterial side and all. Because the venous side push the Thinking lung is just act as a passage. Okay. More the cardiac output will go through the ECMO oxygenator, it will give more oxygenation and the oxygenated blood which will go in the right atria will cross the lung passage as a just a passage, it will not going to give any kind of oxygenation and it will be deflated on your left side. So this is the idea of Venovena ECMO. Okay, so with that idea, how much flow we have given? In, uh, estimated cardiac output was 4.8 liters, we have given 3.2 as a flow. So can the uh, total hmm? total cardiac output be allowed to go through the oxygenator? Yes, we can do it. It will show you how we do this because we have some uh, troubleshooting with that thing. Now, the uh, uh, as you have asked the question, I thought I am thinking is a cardiac output according to the um, uh, age and the body weight and the height. It is five meters. Okay. Now, patient came to you in an ARDS situation where your cardiac output is eight meters. <laughs> Septic, vasodilated, you don't know what is the cardiac output. <coughs> okay, hyperdynamic circulation, 8 liters. Now, if you put the patient on ECMO, VV ECMO, and you are giving 3 liter of flow, will it help? 60%. It is only 40%. So it is not going to. You have a patient as well as you have a saturation name. We will put the patient on ECMO, the saturation will come down to 77. So what patient might do for me, I think they will put the patient on ECMO. At least we have to ensure the 60% of the salary. How we are going to do that? Increase the flow. Number one is the increase the flow. Increase flow, we have to give some volume to increase the flow. We have to give some volume to increase the flow. Now, but we have a mechanism of reducing the cardiac output also. Okay, so ECMO is a fantastic machine which helps in oxygen delivery and reducing the oxygen consumption also. play Who is playing the thing? Our oxygen delivery technique by increasing the flow. Okay, and how we can reduce the Oxygen demand consumption by reducing the cardiac output. I can add cardiac output. How this can come down to 5 liters so that 3 liters of flow is enough for heart? Okay. How? So, how this 8 liter will come down to 5 liters? By either liquid hydrate or stroke. Okay. Here, what we do after putting the patient on ECMO, his temperature is uh, was maybe 102. Okay. What we have shown you that oxygenator also acts as a heat exchanger. You know, we reduce the temperature. 
Okay. Temperature was 102. We reduced it to 98, 97. What will happen? The cardiac output will come down. The hepatitis circulation will come down. Okay. We sedate the patient. It will come down further. Okay. And if not, we can use some beta blocker to reduce the You are not able to increase the flow from 3 to 4 liter to 5 liter because it is, it is not always possible to increase the flow. We will show you what how it will happen. You can decrease the patient's demand of flow. So with the same 3 liter and the patient's cardiac output of 8 liter, with the same 3 liter, if the patient's cardiac output goes down to 5 liter, 60% of the flow will go to your oxygenator and that will suffice. So, both venovenous echo acts by both by increasing the oxygen delivery by allowing your maximum cardiac output to go through the echo oxygenator and by reducing the demand of the patient so that the percentage of this cardiac output doesn't hamper so that the most of the lung amount to active target the maximum cardiac output should go through the echo oxygenator because our lung is not oxygenating any blood. So this is the idea where because BD echo for a 90% problem is the initial not after that you have BD echo that for a second in the basho. You have to have a second in the basho. You have to have a second in the basho. You have to have a second in the basho. You have 140 cardiac output, sepsis, saturation, but you are not able to maintain, optimize the BD echo so that your maximum cardiac output is still going through your this lung. It is not going through your echo oxygenator. So this is the way you have to cook this to show that you to management product to make it up there.
Now, uh, that the thing what we are telling, this same patient after 14 days he was uh, doing fine and X-ray was uh, not improving either. After 14 days we found again the patient is desaturated. Okay, the same flow and all this. So, we uh, uh, repeated and post oxidator EDG okay, to see the oxidator health. Oxidator health, we found the post oxidator EDG shows PO2 of 188 and PCO2 of 43 with a 100% of uh, uh, oxygen given to the oxygen. So, oxidator, we, and we found there are some clots in the oxygen, okay, which has increased. Okay, so, what we level of 100 okay with the flow uh, increase and we started uh, improving the patient I'll show. and we checked a CT after that you can see the CT there is a, there are large bullas has uh, uh, appeared but patient is improving on the lung and oxygenation so we uh, wean the patient off and we uh, discharge the patient with that kind of x You have seen the previous x and the CT and that is the uh, before discharge is having a 94 saturation at the room where it was discharged. So as the weaning has a separate talk, I am not going into that. So this is the way we actually manage this VV ECMO patient. Okay. Now coming to another patient, I will show you the V ECMO because we have a short of time, I think 15 minutes is left. Oxygenator percentage of Bojalo. What are the Purokin to Ekmota Dadiace? Uno idea the Nasle Barbar could dig us to one is to one So coming to the VA. Indication is to increase the cardiac output. 
it is the flow. It is not a good technique to give rest to the organ. Okay, but DBFO is the far superior thing. It increases the oxygenation and gives rest to the lung or rest to the organ for the sensitive needle. Because basic difference is eight. Okay, fine. Now, with that thing, we got a patient who was a 32 year old primary with a postpartum, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy and with a cardiogenic shock who came to us with the ejection fraction of 10%. Okay, now she is incidentally again uh, obese and she came with that kind of uh, monitor, the left side saturation of 77. Hardly any pressure is there. Uh, with the purges, it is coming 160 by 130. That means no uh, ejection is there. Okay. Uh, kind of pressure in the NIVP. And heart rate is 168. And this is the ventilator parameters 100% oxygen uh, with PEEP of 12. And this is the um, uh, your AVG. They have told how much is the PO2? 24. And 51 is your. Uh, so, is it frog coming out of the uh, endotracheal tube, complete pulmonary edema, and kind of uh, peri arrest situation we got her. Now, what we did now, now look at the thing, this is the x ray of her and this is the heart. Okay, hardly any movement, it is just flickering is happening. Okay, there is a movement in the apical part of the heart. So, a patient that key echo. Sure. So you want to bypass the heart and the lung. Okay. So what are the how you want to put the patient on echo? Key uh, calibration protocol. Any for any kind of cardiac condition, this is used. 
the cardiac output is the thing which goes to the end organs ঠিক আছে সে হার্ট দিল কি আমি এক মুহূর্তে কে দিলাম কোন কোন জায়গা থেকে দিলাম দ্যাট ডাজেন্ট ম্যাটার উল্টো দিক দিয়ে গেলো সেটা পার্ট ইউজ করবে উল্টো দিকের পার্টটাও পার্ট ইউজ করে যাবে সমস্যা হবে ঠিক আছে শুধু ওই লিমিটটাতে সমস্যা আছে দ্যাট জন্য আমরা দ্যাট ডিসটার প্রডাকশনটা দিয়েছি ঠিক আছে সো দিস ইজ দা ওয়ে উই ডু দিস নাও এই ক্যালকুলেশন ভিডিওগুলো আমরা পরে দেখাবো ঠিক আছে আমরা একটু কেসগুলোকে ডিসকাস করি সো আফটার পুটিং দা پیشنট অন ECMO this is the condition the saturation has improved tachycardia is settling we have uh, reduced the ventilator and how much flow we have given 2.89 flow amra mota moti maintain korchi and we are maintaining some kind of uh, ejection hero ke ekta kotha bolechilo je amra kintu heart ke inject korte dite hoy ঠিক আছে মানে হার্টটা কি করবে উল্টো দিকে চাপে হার্ট উইল স্টার্ট ডিসটেন্স হ্যাঁ সো হাফ দ্যাট সাই আই টোল ইউ ভি এ কো ডাজেন্ট কনফার্ম এনি অর্গান রেস্ট বিকজ পেরিফেরাল ভি এ কোতে আমরা উল্টো দিক দিয়ে যেহেতু পাঠাচ্ছি ইট গিভস এক্সট্রা প্রেসার অন দা হার্ট তো আমরা চাই যে হার্ট একটু একটু করে ইনজেক্ট করুক ঠিক আছে হার্ট যে ইনজেক্ট করবে তখন আমরা চাই তাহলে হার্টের ইনজেকশনস কি করে বুঝবো আমরা আর্টেরিয়াল পালসেবিলিটি দেখে বুঝবো ঠিক আছে এখানে দেখা যায় যে এই যে প্রেসারটা ইজ ইট ফাইন অনেকটা প্রেসার আছে না 113 ওয়াই 18 ওয়াই দেখেন মনে হচ্ছে ভালো প্রেসার কিন্তু জাস্ট কিপ ইন মাইন্ড দা পালস প্রেসার ইজ হাউ মাচ ইজ ওনলি 15 ওকে দা পালস প্রেসার ইজ ওনলি 15 মানে হার্ট ইজ আন্ডার স্ট্রেস আই লুক এট দা ইকো আফটার পুটিং দা پیشنট অন ইকো দিস ইজ দা ইকো জাস্ট সি দা হাউ ইট ইজ মুভ হার্ডলি এনি মুভমেন্ট ওকে সো দিস হার্ট नीड्स ट्रांसफर Now look at the heart now. This is the heart after seven days of pumping. When peripheral cardiomyopathy is resolved, you can see the difference. Okay, just see. The previous heart was like that. Now it is moving. The all walls are moving. It is coming in and it is giving a good cardiac output. So this is the time where we start weaning. Okay, weaning will be separately dealt with the different. And now, see the blood pressure. आगे कौन सा चीज़? एक्शन तैयार हो गया यार नो बोलो। बाल्स कैसे कौन सा चीज़? हाँ? कौन सा चीज़? ऐसा नहीं चलता तो एक्शन चार बाई बाल्स जाके थे कौन सा चीज़? सर आपने बोली जन हार्ड इंप्रूव कर गए थे ब्लड प्रेशर तो कौन? कौन सा चीज़ इंप्रूव कर बाल्स कैसे कौन सा चीज़? कौन सा चीज़? बी � আমাদের নরমাল ব্লাড প্রেসার তো 120 হয়ে গেছে পালস প্রেসার তো চলে সো পালস প্রেসার ইজ দা ডিটারমিনেন্ট অফ ইওর হার্ট হাউ দা হার্ট ইজ ফাংশনিং অন ইট বুঝা গেল আইডিয়া গুলো আসছে মানে দিস আইডিয়া ইউ হ্যাভ টু ক্যারি ওকে নাও দিস স্পেশাল ইজ আমরা ডিকালকুলেট করছি নাও এক্স রে অলসো ইউ ক্যান ইফ ইউ রিমেম্বার দা प्रीवियस এক্স রে ইট ওয়াজ fully flooded now x is also getting cleared and the patient is also awake and we are uh, mobilizing her outside the bed and she is doing fine so so basics of va ko na bojega na any doubt any where to tell amar kache time ache ache time er puro jinish er upor sara din cholbe kintu thik ache we need time pore ache i any calculation or any basic planning ni kono question thakle ask me any question bombard me with the question i just sir i just সাইজ অফ দা ক্যানুলা সব বলো বলো ক্যানুলা নট পড়ে আলাদা তো এই আইডিয়া করো ক্যানুলা কি করে এস্টিমেট করব হুম লেন্থটা কি করে এস্টিমেট করব ওকে ফাইন 
main standard estimate for you check we take pre measurements for the venous cannula growing to zephyr process because zephyr process corresponds with ivc ra junction ঠিক আছে cannula এর ঢোকার আগে এটা cannula ivc cannula cannula ivc cannula ivc
whether the heart is adequately oxygenating, giving, ejecting the adequately oxygenating blood in the aorta or not, that will be earlier detected by your right hand circulation. Now, if it, there is a mismatch, what will happen? It is known as the Harlequin. Harlequin ke chilo. Harlequin ekta lok chilo, jar mata ta nil chilo, pata lal chilo. So what it suggests, I am doing the right hand saturation dekhi, thikha chhe? Our patient ke, ho tumhe ek mote diga, thikha chhe? Heart is not ejecting, the flow is going up to right up to the thing. Thikha chhe, ho tumhe right hand saturation next to us. Now, heart started improving now. With a bad lung. The heart ko tathe ke blood ka paat chhe? Heart is getting blood from the, through the lung and all the normal way. Lung ke di kharaap tha ke, tale deoxygenated blood haap yaas chhe. Question and heart is ejecting the deoxygenated blood and up to at the level of your aorta. So what we show the first the right hand saturation will go from 100 to it will decrease. It will start decreasing. Okay. And what what are the regions where heart, this disease heart will eject? The coronaries. First branch the coronaries. At the base of the heart, tarpa hoche, matha. A regions below major vessels below the heart common deoxidated blood jet pool. So initial sign K the right hand saturation. So, patient age bhalo chilo, because he is receiving the deoxidated blood in the uh, uh, cerebrals and coronary ST depression. Habe, habe so this is known as the heart equin syndrome. The upper body is blue, lower body is red. Now lower body can red. Because blood body is still supplied by your good flow of the ECMO. This is the idea of Harlequin. The initial Harlequin came from the right hand saturation. Okay, but that was the first branch. So, what is the adequacy of the ECMO? What is the inadequacy of the ECMO? So, he will give the first. But day 3, day 4, when the heart starts improving, and it is receiving the deoxygenated blood because of the bad pulmonary edematous lung, so, the initial saturation dropped out and that, will the, that is the time where actually Harlequin starts, when the heart starts improving with the bad lung. Then we will do something else, we will discuss it later. Okay, VA quota means that it's a retrograde thing. Plethysmo grafta Okay, now SPO2 probe important Can important Because first, we a non pulsatile flow receipt. Yeah, we have 100 saturation and a long bar tana 100 dust. Plethysmo grafta common play coach, when heart starts ejecting. Any pulsatility in the plethysmo graph is equal to the ejection of the heart. Okay, First thing in the case, fourth day, what is the right hand saturation? The pulse is elastic with the saturation of 72. Okay, that means heart is ejecting the bad blood, the blue blood in the coronaries and the cerebrals, and it is causing the heart disease. That is heart disease. So these are the problems typically of an arterial disease. Limb ischemia, bolna, LV distension, bolna, heart disease. ejecting the direct blood or not. ठीक when heart thick, lungs lungs are not good. If lungs are not good, you can't get lungs. If lungs are not good, you can't get lungs. If lungs are not good, you can't get lungs. If 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting two topics. That is the fluid management and the nutrition part in ECMO. Uh, the first one is the fluid management. Uh, so what, that, uh, what are the things we have to look in the patients uh, managing in ECMO? Uh, firstly, how much fluid we have to give? Uh, is my patient is adequately filled or overfilled or underfilled? Like we have to maintain the hydration status. Then uh, is there any kind of fluid loss, ongoing fluid loss, like uh, hemorrhage is very common in our patients. Then uh, what fluid is to be given? Next, uh, my patient, is, does, uh, does the patient need any kind of blood product or not? So all these things, uh, keeping in consideration, we have to choose the uh, type of fluid, amount of fluid, and when to give. Now, uh, there are uh, four phases of fluid resuscitation, we all know. Uh, firstly, when the patient uh, comes to us in an acute shock state, that is the rescue phase. Uh, in, this, uh, in the rescue phase, uh, patient is in shock, uh, BP will be low, and uh, impaired tissue perfusion. In this phase, uh, we will be giving bolus fluids to maintain the hydration and uh, maintain the hemodynamics. Next comes the optimization phase. The optimization phase will be continued for next 24 hours. audible uh, the next phase is the optimization phase uh, here the patient will be in shock but in the compensated shock we don't need to give the uh, bolus fluid we can give fluid in titrated manner uh, mainly we keep our patient uh, on uh, only in fluid for the first 24 hours uh, for the first 24 hours we don't start feeding uh, firstly, we stabilize the patient uh, in the rescue phase, then optimize the patient in first 24 to 48 hours, then only we go for feed. Uh, and the next phase is the stabilization phase. Uh, here we give only the maintenance fluid, the amount patient uh, is having uh, urine loss or any kind of blood loss or uh, <coughs> the daily uh, hourly intake, uh, 1 ml per kg per hour, that much. And then lastly, when we are weaning the patient, uh, we try to make the patient in negative balance. Because all we know that uh, when the patient is in uh, ARDS, uh, we have to keep the patient in negative balance. Otherwise, uh, if the lung is uh, over flooded, then we cannot wean the patient. Uh, now the ECMO patients are fluid overloaded due to uh, many factors. Uh, mainly, they are in uh, uh, severe inflammatory response. Some of them are in sepsis also. And uh, for the cardiac failure patients, uh, they are already in fluid overload. And, uh, but the patients are intravascularly de depleted, although are having uh, net positive balance. So in the initiation of ECMO, there is increased requirement of fluid. Now there are uh, two strategies for uh, fluid management in uh, acute lung injury, uh, conservative and liberal. In our setup uh, for ECMO patients, we always follow the conservative uh, method of uh, fluid giving. Now uh, here I'll be uh, discussing few uh, publications. Uh, all of them suggest that conservative fluid management is always better than liberal fluid management in case of ECMO patients. The first one shows the 60-day uh, mortality is almost at par for both the uh, conservative and liberal strategy, but the ventilator-free days and ICU-free days are always better in conservative strategy. And the need for dialysis is also less in conservative strategy when we are giving less fluid in the initiation days. Next, uh, as per conclusion, we can say no significant difference in 60-day mortality, but improved lung function and shorten the duration of mechanical ventilation without increasing non-pulmonary organ failure in conservative strategy. Now, here is another publication suggesting that uh, there is direct association between cumulative fluid balance in the first uh, three days of ECMO and outcome. That means uh, 
uh, the amount of fluid we are giving in the first three days is directly proportional to the outcome of the patient. If we are overloading the patient in the in, uh, initial phase, uh, then our outcome will be poor. Here the charts also suggesting the same thing, that uh, increased risk of 90-day mortality, patients with uh, higher cumulative fluid balance. Uh, but the mortality risk began to increase significantly uh, when uh, uh, only after a threshold level in uh, cardiovascular disease patient it is up to uh, it is only after 8 to 2 ml per kg and in non cardiovascular disease patients uh, the mortality increases after 180 ml per kg now again another study suggesting that is uh, increased hospital mortality increased duration of ecmo hours and increased mechanical ventilation all increases uh, if we give uh, fluid overload in the ecmo patients Now here we, uh, we are seeing a chart that uh, difference between survivors and non-survivors. Non and clearly we can see in non-survivor group, we have given extra volume in both day one, two, and three. Now what are the things we have to look for in patients of ECMO? Like uh, how we will assess the uh, fluid status in ECMO patients. So. Uh, Firstly, if the patient is in hypovolemic state, uh, there might be uh, chugging or chattering. What is chugging or chattering? That uh, there will be oscillating movement uh, in the pre-pump portion of the circuit, uh, which is suggestive of either the patient is hypovolemia or uh, there might be any clot in the uh, drainage cannula. But, uh, only when there is chattering, we should not give fluid uh, every time. Like uh, chattering is happening and I'm giving extra fluid and chattering is settling down. It, is, it does not work like this. Firstly, we have to assess why the chattering is happening. There may be many causes. Hypovolemia is the most common cause, but there might be other causes too. Firstly, confirm the, uh, there is pre-pump chattering. What is pre-pump chattering? Uh, as I said previously, this chattering, uh, the oscillating movement in the pre-pump portion of the circuit. Uh, later on, it will be uh, shown here. Uh, now, uh, I can give some amount of volume in titrating manner. Uh, let's see if the chattering is settling down or not. I cannot overload the patient with extra volume. And uh, uh, even after some amount of volume, the chattering is not settling down, we will decrease the RPM. Because uh, R, uh, as RPM is high, it is creating a negative suction pressure and it, it is causing chattering. So uh, after decreasing RPM, until I am, uh, I am able to uh, maintain my desired flow, I can reduce RPM. That will again help in reducing the chattering. And uh, even after reducing the RPM, the chattering is not settling down. We can check for the cannula positions. And uh, uh, cannula repositioning can be done. And lastly, if there is any uh, clot or thrombus in the uh, cannula tip, we can, uh, have, we can make uh, another second drainage cannula in the IVC or IJV and uh, continue the circuit with that. Our uh, desire will be to not to give the patient extra volume. Then again, another study showing that uh, albumin is better giving uh, than uh, uh, crystalloids. Now, uh, assessing the fluid status is a bit different uh, in ECMO patients than any other critical care patient. Uh, in uh, normal critical care patients, what we see, we see, uh, we look for CVP, we look for uh, um, IVC collapsibility or aortic VTI, uh, PCWP, all this. But in ECMO patients, uh, the assessing the fluid status is not directly uh, related to these things because we are having already cannula in uh, IVC and uh, it, we are maintaining a continuous flow. So CVP will be a bit erroneous. Uh, we use CVP, but it is not the ideal one. So uh, maintaining the fluid status in, uh, assessing the fluid status in both VA and VV, CVP is not the ideal one for us. Uh, for PCWP, uh, in VA ECMO, we assess uh, fluid status in, uh, by assessing PCWP, but for VV, it is no, not recommended. Thermodilution is not recommended in both because uh, we are giving continuous flow. It will give erroneous result. 
And pulse pressure variation in VA ECMO, as we are giving direct flow to the artery, uh, it, it is of no value in measuring pulse pressure variation, but in VV ECMO, we can assess pulse pressure. Aortic VTI is not applicable for VA as the same reason, but VV we can assess aortic VTI. Now, in the transthoracic ultrasound, we are looking the uh, left ventricular endastolic volume and the cardiac filling uh, ideas. Uh, we can get idea through, uh, some idea through, uh, through transthoracic ultrasound or even TE, but in VV, it is uh, again uh, not that much uh, accurate. Passive leg raising test is uh, uh, helpful in VV, but not in VA. So uh, now, what are the postulated mechanisms by which fluid overload causing adverse outcome? That is, first one, the fluid overload may contribute to increased risk of sepsis in critically ill patient, as most of our ECMO patients are already critically ill, and uh, some of them are already in sepsis. Then ren uh, renal interstitial edema might cause AKI, and uh, extra volume may cause gut edema, which will cause secondary ileus, and that will promote bacterial uh, translocation. And lastly, the hepatic congestion may lead to impaired synthetic function and liver play, as we know, the liver plays an important role in removal of circulating endotoxins. Now in conclusion, we can say the conservative fluid management improves lung function and shortens the duration of mechanical ventilation in intensive care in patients with lung injury. And patients' net fluid balance should kept in negative provided renal and hemodynamic parameters remain stable. Now in a nutshell, uh, in our ECMO patients, uh, what we look for and how we will assess for the fluid status. Uh, in our day-to-day -day practice, uh, we look for the mainly the tissue perfusion and how we measure the tissue perfusion with lactate levels, whether the lactate levels are reducing or not, and then urine output and the uh, mixed venous saturation. These three parameters we mainly look for. And uh, as we are going to the uh, feeding part, we also look for the feeding absorption or not. Okay, uh, my next topic is the nutrition uh, of the ECMO patients. Uh, as uh, are all the ECMO patients are, uh, most of them are in ventilation and critically ill, the nutrition is already depleted. So uh, measuring the in initial body weight is very much difficult for us because most of them come here in the ventilated state. So uh, I, will, I will be discussing a very few topics. That is, uh, what is ideal or desired body weight, what the patient should be ideally weight and actual body weight and estimated or adjusted weight. These are the theory things we all know. Now, uh, what are what we use in our institution? We always promote enteral feed early to start. Uh, we start with trickle feeds. Uh, as I said, for the initial 24 hours, we always keep the patient in IV fluids. Then, uh, second day onwards or third day onwards, we start uh, enteral feeds uh, in the trickle feeds, like 30 or 40 ml in alternate hours. And gradually, uh, if there is a proper absorption of feeds, we gradually increase the amount of feed and decrease the fluid. Uh, our target is to uh, keep the patient uh, up to 80% in enteral feed uh, by third day. By uh, guidelines, we can use also TPN if there is no enteral feed absorption uh, by five to seven days. Uh, but uh, here we try to avoid TPN because it also increases the risk of sepsis. Now here are the points where patient needs extra protein. Uh, in our case, uh, the most of the patients are in sepsis and, uh, se sorry, no, not sepsis, most of the patients are critically ill and in severe infection, uh, so their protein needs are already raised. 
uh, for, this is the techniques how we can give uh, feed. Uh, mainly we give nasogastric, uh, mainly we give feed to, uh, through the riles tube because they are in already ventilation. And uh, in very few awake ECMOs where the pen, uh, patient is not in ventilation, we can give oral feed also. Uh, so oral or supplements, enteral, parental, everything we can give. Now what are the benefits of formula or medical feed? That is, uh, it is, uh, contains high protein with balanced amino acid, free of allergens, lactose, gluten, no animal product, uh, low in sugar, easily digestible and customized as, as per the patient's need. Because uh, from the doctor's side, we uh, advise the volume of feed what to be given. Like I'm uh, suggesting that uh, 100 ml alternate hour the patient will be getting and our dietitians are suggesting what amount of uh, nutrition they should get and, uh, and what formula feed they will be getting. And now these are the formulae. That is a balanced formula, uh, high protein formula, renal formula, dialysis formula, hepatic formula, uh, as per the need of the patient and type of the patient. If the patient uh, is not in dialysis but renally impaired, we give low protein uh, feed. But if, when the patient is in dialysis, we can give high protein feed. And uh, in balanced uh, formula, in our most patients and high protein formula, we give isoosmolar balanced nutrition. And uh, this part I have discussed. Now, the, what is the importance of timing of nutrition in critically ill patient? The enteral nutrition should be started as early as possible. In case of uh, nutrition requirement is not met adequately, even after seven days of ICU admission, we can go for parenteral nutrition. And uh, tube feeding is to be considered even uh, uh, 50 to 60 percent of nutrition target are not ma met adequately within 72 hours of initiation of nutrition support. Okay, now uh, how we uh, actually start our feeding? Uh, we start feed with trickle feeds like 30 to 40 ml alternate hour. Then after giving uh, four or five feeds, we do aspiration. Uh, like if I have given th 300 ml and there is uh, aspirate is coming like 150 ml, then I have to stop feeding because uh, when the uh, more than one third of amount I have given, uh, it suggests that patient is not absorbing the feed. In that case, I have to increase the amount of fluid and wait for some time that patient will start absorbing the feed. And if the amount uh, of uh, aspiration is less than one third the amount I have given, then I can continue the feed. Then uh, there may be many causes uh, why the patient is not absorbing the feed. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, very high anotropic support. When the patient is in very high anotropic support as in, and in sepsis, there is uh, chances of not absorption of uh, feed. And when we stop feeding, when we are planning some procedure like tracheostomy or uh, extubation, and when there is no bowel sounds or when there is raised enzymes like amylase, lipase, and LFTs are raised, then we can stop feed for some time, then wait, then again start feed after some time. Then these are the causes of GI and feeding intolerance. Uh, now how we can uh, assess the uh, absorption and uh, uh, what to assess. Uh, that symptoms of intolerance are complaints of pain. A patient may complain of abdominal pain, raised enzymes, abdominal distension may be there. If, there, uh, if the patient is complaining pain abdomen, having vomiting and having abdominal distension, then uh, we have to aspirate the feed. Then we will look for again the same thing, whether one, uh, more than one third of uh, the amount I have given is getting absorbed or not. And uh, th then we can keep the patient in 45 degree uh, elevated state. Uh, it uh, promotes uh, fluid absorption. And uh, if there is no IPS, we can, uh, as we check uh, serial ABGs, the blood potassium level plays an important role in fluid absorption and gut motility. So if there is uh, hypokalemia, we have to always correct the potassium level. That also promotes the uh, gut motility and improves uh, feed absorption. Then serial abdominal radiographs we take. If there is a se uh, severe gut distension, then we have to stop feeding. Then um, we can also give some uh, prokinetic drugs uh, to promote motility. 
Now, what is uh, gastric residual volume? The, it is the amount aspirated from stomach following administration of enteral feed. Normally, gastric residual volume is uh, less than 500 ml, 6 hourly, considered safe and G uh, GIT is functioning. Now, what is uh, the protocol? Protocol, uh, when there is high gastric residual volume, more than 500 ml, we stop enteral feed for 6 hours, then wait for 6 hours. Okay, uh, then restart enteral feed after 6 hours. Then again we will check what is the gastric residual volume. Uh, even after 6 hours there is raised gastric uh, residual volume, we will decrease our, the amount of feed and we will make a balance between the feed and fluid. And uh, then even, uh, even after six, uh, 6 hours, if the gastric residual volume is high, then we have to stop feed and uh, if uh, the feed is getting absorbed, then we can continue. And uh, lastly, we can consider uh, nasojejunal tube and gastric decompression. Then we have to uh, very cautious about the glycemic control and uh, uh, it will take care of the sepsis part also. And uh, here in our setup, we always used a uh, closed feeding system uh, because uh, there, uh, there is less chances of infection and uh, less chances of contamination. Now, uh, what are the challenges during ECMO? There might be gut ischemia, as uh, most of the patients are in very high anotropic support, uh, and many of them in also vasopressin that promotes gut ischemia. We have seen a few of our patients who are under gut ischemia <coughs> due to high anotropic support, and uh, patient may have malabsorption, hypoxia, and high metabolic stress also. Now, what are the key points? Uh, we have to look for ECMO patients uh, and nutrition. The enteral nutrition is well tolerated. Early enteral nutrition is advisable. Start with trickle feeds and PPN with trickle feed can be considered. High protein and adequate calories we should consider. Uh, low insoluble fiber uh, we should give. Uh, fat as per tolerance, micronutrient supplementation should be given and easily digested food, easy to swallow to be uh, chosen and nutritional supplement to be added. And we should avoid overfeeding uh, because it may cause refeeding syndrome, hyperglycemia, hypercapnia and hyperlipidemia and uh, mostly fluid overload. Now, these are the key points. Early initiation of enteral nutrition in critically ill patient is associated with improved clinical outcome and non-commercial uh, enteral feed are more prone to bacterial contamination and thereby increase the risk of nosocomial infection and ready to hang chosen enteral system are sterile, easy to handle and we should always go for uh, the closed systems. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any question? Okay, thank you. We'll proceed to our next session. Our next topic is nursing, physiotherapy, and post igmo care. Our speaker is Dr. Rituparna Das, consultant, critical care, igmo physician, and cardiac anesthesia. Good afternoon, everybody. 
so we'll continue into an integral part, which is a necessity without which we cannot uh, send our patients home, how, however well we uh, give our ECMO and maintain our patient on ECMO. So uh, though the whole entire thing is not done by the ECMO physicians, but still uh, this is a necessary part which has to be regulated by us. So first of all, ECMO is a team game. It does not uh, need only the perfusionists and the ECMO physicians, but also the other necessary parts like the uh, ICU critical care nurses, the physiotherapists, psychologists in some cases. Okay, so we'll first begin with the nursing care. So first, uh, as already discussed, uh, in order to uh, reduce the cardiac output, uh, or rather the demand of the patient, uh, the patient will be kept on sedation. So daily sedation vacation is a must to assess the neurological integrity of the patient. Uh, next, uh, regarding the sedation scales, uh, there'll be sedation agitation scale, the bispectral index, the train of four near infrared spectroscopy, which are monitored. The nurses will be maintaining lots of papers and regularly updating on them. And uh, NIRS is a very integral tool apart from the saturation probe. We use in our patients. GCS, I would like to mention, is not very useful because the patient will be on sedation in most cases, unless on the uh, verge of weaning. So here we are showing, um, this is our NIRS monitor, which is showing the cerebral oxygen saturation on the right and left side. Um, this is, uh, this picture I would like to mention on the down corner. <laughs> Here the probe has been used to see the uh, vascular integrity of the limb in which the cannulation has been done. This is another use of the NIRS probe, okay? Not only the cerebral oximetry we are seeing, monitoring with it, also as already discussed in the previous lectures told by Arpan sir, that uh, there will be chances of vascular damage, there may be vascular ischemia. NIRS probes can be used there also to see whether the muscles of the uh, cannulated limbs are viable or not. <coughs> okay, so as our patients will be on extracorporeal circuit, they will be kept on um, uh, anticoagulation, right? So risk of uh, hemorrhage will be there uh, all over the body on the cannulation sites as well as in the closed chambers like uh, we are very afraid of cerebral vascular injuries which can be both ischemic type and hemorrhagic type. Uh, coming to e, uh, imaging, neuroimaging, EEG may be required in some patients if we are having complications like seizures and all. Pupillary reaction is a must. Uh, if our patient is not awake, we are not keeping them awake, then we'll check the pupillary reaction every hourly, okay? And pain stimulus response to pain stimulus. Now coming to monitoring on the respiratory system. Now some may be uh, have a query that why am I talking of the monitoring uh, in nursing care? Because the basic bedside monitoring will be done by the uh, trained nurse who is at bedside. Okay, sometimes we'll be having one is to one allocation or even sometimes uh, two nurses for a patient on ECMO. And they will be the first persons who will be raising the alarms to us. Uh, okay, coming to respiratory system, um, plethysmograph. About the plethysmograph, as already discussed, ECMO is a non-pulsatile flow. So plethysmograph may not show a proper curve at times. Uh, in case of veno-arterial ECMO, monitoring of the SpO2 is done categorically in the right index finger or right hand, any of the fingers of the right hand so that we can see the adequacy of the veno-arterial ECMO, as well as we can identify any incidence of Harlequin syndrome appearing as early as possible, okay? Coming to the ABG, we'll see for the PO2 and the PCO2 levels. ETCO2, this ETCO2 monitoring comes during weaning because ETCO2 will be generated from the lungs, the native lungs of the patient. If the patient is, uh, at a stage where weaning can be initiated, it means that the patient's lungs have started improving. So keeping in mind the ETCO2 level at that point of time will continue the uh, weaning procedure, okay? And 
In the rest of the situation, it will be the PCO2 which will guide us as to how much of sweep gas we are going to keep in our ECMO machine. Now, ventilators are continued in rest settings. That is a rate of around 12 to 14, 50% uh, le or less FiO2, a tidal volume of three, 4 ml per kg body weight, and a PEEP, uh, as per ARDS protocol, initially it was told higher PEEP helps us, but during the COVID scenario, we've seen that higher PEEP has landed, up, landed us in complications like spontaneous pneumothorax in so many cases, from which we have not been able to come out. So we prefer a PEEP of maximum 8 to 10, not more than that, usually. Now, coming to ECMO, FiO2 and sweep gas, we'll be uh, reiterating them in our uh, tables once again. Um, there'll be four parameters in the ECMO machine. Uh, we will be having our bedside nurses as well as our perfusionists sitting on the bedside to monitor these four numbers. First is the uh, FiO2 kept in the blender, the sweep gas, and the RPM, that is rotations per minute, and the flow that it is generating. They will also be monitoring the color of the uh, cannula, the color of blood in the cannula, whether there is presence of color difference or not. And they will also be monitoring the cannulation sites for any bleeding, hematoma, or anything. Now, chest x-rays, we'll be doing daily chest x-rays. Um, and uh, during position of the, positioning of the patient for uh, putting the plate uh, of the chest x-ray plate, it's very important because we'll be having cannulas and the invasive lines, uh, the endotracheal tube in the initial phase, and then later on the tracheostomy tubes and all. So nothing should get disconnected. So this is a very cumbersome and a very responsible job to be done. Uh, now, next coming to suction. As our patients will be on anticoagulation, suction has to be avoided, or rather I should say, it should be customized, okay? Patients will definitely pool secretion, so suction is required. Keeping in mind whether the patient is bleeding or not, endotracheal suction has to be done or not, has to be judicious, uh, has to be done judiciously. Coming to uh, suction of other areas, like oral suction. Oral suction is uh, avoided completely avoided. They'll be doing oral care with gauge piece soaked in chlorhexidrine solutions, okay? Uh, because uh, mucosal bleeding, once it happens, it's very difficult to take control of. Um, requirement of bronchoscopic toileting is also there. Uh, we'll be talking when we'll uh, come to our tables about uh, specific uh, small things like these. Uh, even during bronchoscopic toileting, we have to be careful about whether we are insulting uh, the airway and we are causing uh, bleeding inside or not, okay? Okay, and uh, early tracheostomy is advocated. Usually within first seven days, if my patient is not in overt sepsis, we'll go for percutaneous bedside tracheostomy. And uh, these patients are very prone to have peritracheostomy bleeds. So it has to be kept in mind that initial phase after the tracheostomy is performed, we don't try to dislodge the peritracheostomy dressings because that allows a bit of clot formation. Once around more than 12 hours uh, passes, our coagulation profiles are fine. It's not bleeding uh, uh, very, uh, uh, like the bleeding is not very high. It's not drooping and uh, uh, like uh, uh, wetting my gotch pieces too much. Then I will remove the uh, dressing and go for the second set of dressing. This is first. If there is torrential hemorrhage, other methods are tried. We can try for bedside, uh, uh, you know, uh, coagulation using cautery and upsizing of the uh, tracheostomy tube. So usually for a male patient, we'll be doing it with an eight-size tracheostomy tube, and we may need to upsize it to 8.5-size uh, tracheostomy tube. And early tracheostomy is always advocated, and the care of tracheostomy, as I said, and also maintaining all the VAP protocol, that is very important, like 45 degree head up, the prevention of gastric ulcers, regular toileting, again keeping in mind that my patient is not bleeding inside. And in a bleeding airway, I'm not going to do suction, okay? And consideration of adrenaline nebulization in case of, uh, you know, uh, bleeding inside the airway. Now, coming to GI tract, as already stated, we will be initiating parenteral nutrition as soon as possible, maybe within the first 48 hours. And if my patient is not tolerating the 
required adequate amount of feed, we will still be trying to feed the patient giving trickle feed. This prevents, uh, you know, ma maintains the mucosal integrity of the gut. So presence of bowel sound, that is one necessity. Uh, as already discussed in the previous talk, uh, that we use continuous feed pumps. So uh, for every shift change of the nurses, we'll be very uh, meticulously checking for the position of the Riles tube, okay? Since uh, they are in a tendency of uh, changing only the bag, we don't know whether positioning of the patient while giving back care and all, they have dislodged the Riles tube position by any chance. So uh, securing, identifying the position of the Riles tube, then continuing with the feed, maybe in the continuous pump is a necessity. Uh, next is aspiration. As already stated, regular aspiration is not done. F first, after initiation, maybe at an interval of four, uh, first, after the first four feeds or first four hours as we have initiated. Like, if I'm giving alternate hour feed, I'll be aspirating maybe after four feeds, that is eight hours, okay? If I'm giving early feed, then maybe after first four feed, we'll just check for absorption is present or not. And then we will restrict the amount of, uh, you know, intervals of aspiration to maybe eight hours, 12 hours, or as per the patient. Uh, these parts have already been uh, discussed. High protein diet, need for uh, TPN if the patient is not accepting enteral nutrition. Maintenance of glucose and calories, very important. And uh, whether the patient is passing stool or not, whether he is in need of any prokinetic or not, and need for flatus tube. Again, uh, flatus tube insertion is a very, uh, you know, difficult procedure, I would say, in such patients because they'll be anticoagulated. Coming to renal system, early urine output. This is again monitored by the nurse's bedside. Uh, not only the early urine output, but the color of the urine and uh, the integrity of the catheter, catheter care as per critical care uh, protocol. Uh, need for diuretics. Now, whether my patient is overloaded. Now, diuretics don't come into use in the initiation phase. There'll be a phase when we have started the ECMO and we'll be requiring bolus fluids for the patient in the form of maybe, uh, you know, crystalloids or albumin or maybe blood and blood products. So that is not the time when the patient needs diuresis. He needs to be um, put on diuretics uh, maybe on a later stage, uh, taking into consideration the uh, um, overloaded lung or the distended heart. In that case, we need to uh, keep in mind that IV diuretics don't work well because they'll be uh, causing a sudden output of urine that may result in flow fluctuations which are in our ECMO circuit and that may manifest as chattering in our lines. We'll show you, we'll try to show you in our tables. Uh, so that is important. So continuous diuresis is a better option than a, a sudden diuresis of a huge volume urine. So that needs to be uh, understood. Now, patients who are not making urine and have become, um, you know, uh, re, uh, have gone into AKI, uh, they may need renal support in the form of continuous renal replacement therapies. So this, uh, again, we'll demonstrate in our tables. Uh, there are various places where we can um, connect our uh, dialysis to the uh, patient. The, First can be the uh, dialysis catheter inserted in the patient in as in normal other patients. This we have to keep in mind since it's an anticoagulated patient, insertion of a new line has to be uh, done with caution, okay? And if there is lack of expertise, we will avoid inserting a next new line and maybe we will connect our uh, dialysis to the, uh, you know, the ECMO circuit itself. There'll be an option to connect cytosol filters also to the ECMO circuit because that can take care of the inflammatory markers if my patient needs so. And this cytosol can be with or without a ongoing dialysis. Now, as, uh, okay. Now dosage of heparin is also important in dialysis. My patient is one. Whether I'm doing the anticoagulation through an external source, we, I'm doing it through an already anticoagulated circuit in my ECMO, or I'm using it in dialysis, the monitoring remains the same. It will be ACT initially in the first 24 hours, and later on it will be the APTT, okay, beyond 24 hours. Usually APTT is done every 12 hourly. We'll be taking into consideration the 
platelet counts also. And if uh, in coagulopathy, if deranged liver functions are there, we'll consider for <coughs> other things like TEG and all. Okay, and one more thing we should keep in mind, SIR will be dealing with the weaning part of ECMO, but one thing to be kept in mind that patient may need dialysis even after weaning of ECMO. Now this is, uh, I don't think how clear it is, is uh, being seen from there. This is one of our patients receiving dialysis with the cytosorb circuit, okay? Those who are sitting in the last chair, this will be the cytosorb filter and this is the normal dialysis we are using. Now, hemodynamics, even this is taken care of and monitored, not taken care of, rather monitored by a nurses at bedside. Uh, first, coming to the multi-channel monitors, ECG, uh, looking for the rate, any arrhythmia, need for rate control to be determined by us. We have already discussed in our initial lectures the need, why there is need for rate control. Uh, the blood pressure, again, since ECMO is a non-pulsatile uh, circuit, we will we may not have a pulse pressure or a systolic diastolic, uh, two numbers we may not get. So mean arterial pressure is what is monitored and pulse pressure becomes important when my heart is improving, right? Any pulse pressure of 20 or more is an indicator of an improving heart. Right, Needs for, uh, need for anotropes and vasopressors, this will be there in most patients. Uh, so uh, if not anotropes and vasopressors, we'll be having sedatives, uh, muscle relaxants in some. So they will always be uh, entering our patients through the central lumen and the central lines in syringe pumps have to be daily uh, taken care of. Uh, the site of entry of the central lines, all the cannulation sites, they are covered by occlusive dressings which are transparent in nature. And usually they are changed a lot formation over there. We will look and we have seen the cannulation sites getting excoriated. So the maintaining the integrity of the uh, site, uh, whether any pus is forming there or not, whether it, clots are forming there or not, one thing to be kept in mind, in a uh, initial stage when there is ongoing bleeding, whatever kind of clot has formed is tried not to be dislodged because that uh, harbors more bleeding, okay? So once the bleeding has settled, then we will go for the removal of the clot. And uh, the removal of the transparent dressings, even that is important because that is in many cases done by our nurses. They will remove the dressing from distal to uh, towards the cannulation site. That may prevent uh, inadvertent uh, pulling out of the lines. Okay. Okay, one more thing is uh, the connections have to be taken care of, whether we are losing, whether we are uh, losing maybe inotropes outside and uh, faulty lines, that is. Uh, we will look for, again, drawing of blood. This is very important. We avoid IM and subcut injections in these patients. Uh, again, CBG check, this is very important. We prevent, uh, we would, uh, try to avoid finger pricks because, again, the same reason, anticoagulated patient. And they will be drawing blood from the lines, so asepsis has to be maintained very meticulously, otherwise we'll end up in sepsis, right? And uh, uh, coming to ABG. ABG monitoring the requirement, the numbers, these we have dealt with previously, uh, and most of us working in critical care unit will be knowing the importance of PO2, PCO2, lactate, potassium, acid, and uh, you know, the base excesses. Not going into that, what's specific for my patient, a patient on ECMO? Uh, we have to remember that if a patient is having a veno uh, arterial ECMO, the return cannula or a venovenous ECMO, the return, can return cannula is in the femoral, okay? So we have got a femoral arterial axis, we have got a radial arterial axis, maybe in my patient. The monitoring of the ABG will be from the radial side. This has to be kept in mind because as my return of oxygenated blood is into the femoral, if I'm drawing blood from the femoral arterial side of the patient, I'm actually not measuring the uh, patient's ABG. What I'm taking care is of the ECMO ABG, right? Which I can always get it done from the post-oxygenator circuit, I mean the port we have in our ECMO. This has to be kept in mind. Uh, veterans will be looking at the ABG and telling us from which site we have taken, you know, looking at the PO2. If I have a proper oxygenator working. 
Now coming to cardiac output and the cardiac index, we um, may take help of this. Um, echo is very important in the weaning stage, right? Every 48 hours we'll be assessing for the echo, seeing for any changes that is happening in our um, cardiac function. And when we have decided for the weaning, certain parameters are important. One is the RV and LV function, definitely. Other is the TAPC and the aortic or the LVOT VTI. This is very important. Any VTI uh, more than 12 to 14 uh, will be an indication for, uh, you know, uh, continuing winning trial. Okay. Now, uh, there was one uh, thing mentioned by Arpan sir in the previous lecture that uh, we know arterial ECMO can cause uh, dilatation of the ventricles, right? So there, there are various methods in which this dilatation of the LV can be offloaded. One such is IABP. One thing I would like to mention is a patient already put on venu arterial ECMO will not need an IABP after that. Okay, we go for other methods like LV venting and all, right? But maybe I had initiated an IABP before going into a venu arterial ECMO. That kind of patient will be usually continued on a IABP, right? Once I'm very happy with my ECMO run and my patient is showing a steady improvement in the cardiac output, I may, I may try to remove the IABP. It usually does not uh, have any, uh, you know, interaction with my uh, ECMO function in that way. Existing IABP usually is maintained. Uh, IABP in such a case will help me in offloading the LV overload. And uh, it, uh, normally, we maintain it at one is to two ratios. So on a VA ECMO, VA ECMO, if I'm having an IBP running, I may keep it at one is to four, two. Right, next is very important, the assessment of the uh, limbs, uh, more so the cannulated limbs. Uh, so uh, we have already put in a distal perfusion cannula, which is giving me adequate blood supply to, the, uh, to maintain the uh, limb and prevent limb ischemia. Uh, now what we monitor in bedside, we'll be looking for the calf muscle thickness, the, any temperature change or any color change appearing locally over there, and we'll be looking for Doppler assessment. Doppler ultrasound is done. What will we get in our Doppler? Um, uh, we will get a continuous flow. flow. This has to be kept in mind. We'll not have pulsatility, okay? And uh, how to assess? that it is uh, uh, adequate for the distal limb, will be uh, having an assistant over there who will be closing the port and for just a fraction of a second, we lose the uh, Doppler flow. And again, once it's open, re-establishment of the flow indicates that the distal perfusion is happening. Again, vascular changes I told and bleeding. <coughs> Now coming to some general care, oral hygiene, no suction as I've already said. Care of eyes. In sedated paralyzed patients, we'll be giving regular um, uh, drops to moisten the eye. And once we are proning uh, the patient, we have gone through so many proning sessions in the near past, so eye have to be taken care of to prevent corneal ulcers. So securing the eye is very, very important. We may not send our patients home, but the eyes have to be intact. Now, change of body posture at regular intervals for preventing pressure sores, uh, pressure relief mattresses being used, and float heels. We'll show you what float heels are. And we usually use it at all the bony prominences, the heels, the elbows, and maybe in some in the scapular regions also. Okay, and um, uh, one more thing is uh, the change of body posture, or that is back care. That is usually given in office hours. This is very important. We'll be having so many lines and cannulas. We'll be needing an um, uh, array of uh, people helping us to change the position of the patient, and it is usually done in the office hours so that we don't land up in a mess. Okay, so this is one of our patient uh, already proned. We have so many people around taking care of the various lines and uh, uh, tubes and everything. <clears throat> I think in the second picture, a bit of uh, how we take care of the eyes have been shown. Uh, we'll try to show it in our tables too. These are float heels we were talking about. Comes in the market in the name of Elvin Heels and Elvin Sacrum. Okay, they, are, they may even be applied on the um, uh, uh, shoulder blades. 
Coming to the second part, physiotherapy and mobilization. This is very important because they are the most serious kind of people in the highest kind of critical illness, and they're very prone to develop polymyoneuropathy. So uh, the, why does this deconditioning happen? Uh, this is because of the prolonged sedation, maybe paralysis, invasive lines, ventilation, sepsis, multi-organ failures, and loss of muscle mass. And also definitely loss of cardiorespiratory reserve, right? So. Uh, not going into very details of it, how we prone, how, how we go for physiotherapy and mobilization is more important. So we have to take care of the monitors, ventilators, infusion lines, pumps, and anything coming out of the patient. You know, the, I haven't mentioned the Foley's catheter, even that. Uh, all these tend to reduce the range of mobility of the patient. So that is important. We have to take care of all of them. Uh, now, uh, why early mobilization is important? It improves the cognitive function of the patient and functional capacity. It shortens the ICU stay, reduces duration of mechanical ventilation in certain cases, and also delirium. Uh, post-operative, uh, post, sorry, the uh, psychosis that happens in, for in long ICU stays, even that is taken care of by early mobilization. Also, mobilization of secretions and uh, reducing incidences of vapanol. Now, contraindications, where we will not go for physiotherapy of the patient who are hemodynamically not stable on steep vasopressors and inotropes, who are having unstable cardiac arrhythmias, desaturation episodes, even with minimal movements or chugging of the drainage circuits maybe, and patients who are extremely sedated on complete, just knocked off, okay? So we will, there is no use of mobilizing these patients apart from only uh, physiotherapy done for the limbs. So there are actually three kinds of physiotherapy being taken uh, that is being done. One will be passive physiotherapy, which is done in these knocked out patients to maintain the muscle mass of the limbs and all. The second will be active uh, assisted and the third will be active. Active assisted is when we are doing off with the sedation for the patients and we have kept him partially awake, we have uh, made him communicative and he can follow some of the commands. Okay? And the third will be active. That is when my patient is absolutely off sedation, maybe off ECMO also. So this part, active uh, physiotherapy gets continued into the post-ECMO care also. So here my patients will do cycling of the limbs, they'll be doing, they'll be, uh, doing leg dangling at the bedside, they'll be sitting outside maybe also, okay? So what are the considerations we need to take? Uh, the cannula and all the lines that are coming out of the body have to be secured, that's all. And uh, it seems that's all, but we will re uh, be needing dedicated single persons uh, for each thing. Like one person will be taking care of the tube, one person will be taking care of the cannula, one will be taking care of the lines, and they will be taking care of only that. One will be monitoring the ECMO uh, monitor for the change in the flow or anything that is happening. Okay. And once we are, when we are instituting the ECMO, we'll be careful to keep the tubing lengths adequate so that we can go in for all such kinds of uh, movements of our patient. So again, as I had started off coming to the same thing, once again, it's a multidisciplinary team approach. One single person can never do an ECMO successfully. That's never done. So it is never me, it's always us, right? So each member will be having a defined role. There'll be an ECMO consultant who will be taking the decision that my patient needs mobilization and we'll be having nurses, physiotherapists, and professionals together with us. Um, one more thing which I have uh, not put in the slide is psychological rehabilitation. That is also very important. Once my patient starts getting awake, we'll be um, asking, uh, like, uh, allowing them communication with their family in all forms. We'll be um, uh, becoming very lax in the visiting hours of our patients, uh, relatives. We'll be allowing them at bedside uh, for long durations, allowing them communication. Uh, com to communicate with their uh, patient because this has a very good impact on the mm, uh, psychological side of the patient. Now what complications we can have? Desaturation, hypotension, tachycardia, sudden drop in ECMO flows, bleeding from cannulation sites or accidental displacement of cannula. This is the same thing in a schematic format about how we approach to a patient for physical therapy. So I think my videos might play.
तो ये तो देखो तो ना इट्स रेशन है शो रफ किट किड़ा को देखो हाँ पेंड्रेव छेत्र तक है नीचे ना पेंड्रेव तक ही प्ले कोची I thought this will be happening. Are you talking about this? Yes. Are you talking about this? Only video. 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 स्लाइड अम्म के पेन ड्राइव टेन पेन ड्राइव अम्म के पेन ड्राइव टेन ठीक है चलो ये बेनिफिट भी ताली देंगे देर इस देर इस सो वी यूज्ड टू डू वेरी आर्डिंग टेक्नोस्टमीज ऑन एक्सपो टू थ्री थिंग्स नंबर वन इस ओरल ट्यूब इस ऑलवेज द सोर्स ऑफ इन्फेक्शन द कॉलोनाइजेशन एंड ऑल दिस थिंग्स just see that video. This is our patient who is doing cycling. रोटी का चे
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam. Any question regarding this topic? face it. We had uh, for a very prolonged period we were running one ECMO. What happened was there, uh, there is a U connector uh, in the necklines. Uh, the uh, material of the cannula and the U connector are different. So uh, there was a leakage, a rupture from that side which we had faced but that was not during mobilization. During mobilization till date we haven't landed in any accident. Yes. One step uh, we had changed, that was we were not uh, making the nick with the blade. We were dilating directly in, on the skin. And uh, if they were bleeding even over that, maybe after uh, 12 or 24 hours, we were upsizing the tube. We were not... This is only with the percutaneous I'm talking about. We are not taking our patients to OT for any surgical tracheostomy. So, sir, yeah, I'm requesting you to take over for the next lecture, weaning a patient on ECMO. Thank you very, very much, ma'am. And our last but not the least of the theory part,
Topic is winning, very vital part, winning of VIGMO and VVIGMO, a case discussion. And our speaker is Honorable Dr. Dipanjan Chatterjee, Senior Consultant, Critical Care, IGMO Service, and Cardiac Anesthesiology. Hand it over to Sir. So, uh, we have seen how we select the patients for ECMO, initiate ECMO, then how do we manage the patients on ECMO? What do we do during management? And uh, then we have to assess whether the patient is improving or not. And our target is to get off ECMO because we know that ECMO is a temporary support. It is not a permanent support. So we have to win off ECMO. We become like entering into a chakra view and like an Abhimanyu, we cannot come out of it. So this is a very common problem that we face. Many people uh, feel it. It is easier to put the patient on ECMO, but coming off ECMO may be difficult. So we need to know when, how we have to wean the patient of ECMO and what is the post-ECMO care. That is also very important. So what is weaning? Weaning is a process when the organ that you have uh, supported that is improving, we are coming down on the support level. And what is trial of? Trial of is when the organ has fun function has developed to an extent when we can sub stop the ECMO and see whether the organ is being able to support the normal physiological processes of the body. Okay, so these the two are different things. So first we go for winning, and if the winning is successful, what we say that we go for a trial of, that is ECMO is stopped and seen. It is not disconnected. So I'll describe two cases. It's, we have to discuss about the VA ECMO winning and VV ECMO winning. They are the two different ways of doing it. So this was a 50-year-old male patient who came to our institute, uh, was having a chest pain, uh, breathlessness, previously admitted outside, and NGO showed that having a severe triple vessel disease with a left main arterial disease. He was admitted here on 27th with a higher creatinine, with a poor ejection fraction, and TAPSA was borderline 12, was on BiPAP, and LASIK's infusion was given because he was in LVF. So that is the usual management that we all do. So the next day after this, the patient improved slightly. We changed over to a nasal oxygen. But after two days, the patient again went to a, went to a low cardiac output state, oliguric, cold extremities, hypotensive, rising lactates, and we started anotropic support, put in an arterial and central line, 
Still the patient not improving, what we do is we ventilate the patient and the put, put the patient on IABP. There's a basic mechanical circulatory support that we do. Next, after two days of stabilization, we take the patient for revascularization because unless you revascularize, the heart is not going to improve. We did an on-pump CABG, three grafts, came off with uh, quite a bit of supports and ventilation. On the day of surgery evening, we found that the patient is having a low urine output, hypotensive in spite of very high supports, arrhythmias occurring, uh, ectopics coming, and lactate is increasing in uh, ABG, and LV as it is, he was showing a poor contractility. What to do next? So we have already given inotropes, you are given uh, patient on ventilation. Surgery has been done. The patient is on IBP. Now you have to support the organs because unless you support the tissue perfusion, uh, the patient is not going to get better. ABG was showing a lactate of 6.1 and increasing up to the 7.5. We initiated a peripheral VA ECMO on the same day evening with a drainage cannula of 24 French in the femoral vein going right in, into the RA and the return cannula, the oxygenated blood is given through the 16 French uh, cannula into the femoral artery. And after that, and along with it, we put in a distal perfusion cannula with uh, seven French. The urine output improved, the arrhythmia settled after a few hours of ECMO run. The lactate came down and the, you can see that the pulse fertility improved, the pulse pressure was improved. So the hemodynamics are improving. On second, second, we had done the surgery. This is on seventh, ECO is showing slightly better uh, cardiac function. On the sixth post-op day, we thought of weaning the patient. Since the ECO has improved slightly, we are started to come down on the ECMO flow. This is a VA ECMO where we are coming down on the flow, blood flow, okay. So we started to come down on the blood flow. You can see this is the RPM and this is the, how much is the flow that is getting generated. We came down up to 0.6. The hemodynamics remained okay, but see the acidosis minus seven. Lactate has not yet increased, lactate was 1.2, but the acidosis appeared. So it is, it was decided to go back on full ECMO flows. So what we saw, we, we saw the ECO, we saw the hemodynamics, and we planned winning, and during winning, we were assessing the hemodynamics as well as the blood gases to see whether the tissue perfusion is adequate with reduced support level from ECMO. So we abandoned the weaning process and went back. On the ninth post-op day, the hemodynamics was this, the lung picture was good and we started weaning again. You can see that the flows are coming down and with the lower flows, Hemodynamics maintained, PA pressure has come down. That means the left heart function is improved. And ABG showed lactate was normal, 1.3, 1.9, and there was no metabolic acidosis. So, and also we saw the ECO and assessed the aortic VTI. What is aortic VTI? We place a PW cursor in the uh, LVOT and we see the LVOT VTI and it should be more than 12. It gives an idea of how much is the cardiac output. 
native cardiac output. Okay. So it has to be more than 12 to go for further weaning. Here we had an 18 VTI. ECMO decannulation. For all purposes, the arterial cannula has to come out surgically under surgical exposure because unless you take out surgically, there is a chance of bleeding and hematoma. It's a large cannula. You, you cannot take it out percutaneously. Insert it percutaneously, but take out surgically, always. But the venous cannula can come out percutaneously. There is very less chance of bleeding, and almost always we take it out percutaneously, unless it is side by side. So you can see that the arterial while uh, cannula going into the femoral artery. You, this you can see only when you are taking out the cannula. And these are distal perfusion cannula. These are the distal perfusion cannulas which go lower into the femoral artery. Though it is the inser skin insertion site is higher, but the actual insertion into the femoral artery is lower down. So this patient on the 11th post-op day after weaning of the ECMO, the patient was tracheostomized, uh, then went for a PS trial, then tracheolife, IBP was removed. We kept the IBP during taking a weaning of the ECMO. So keeping the IBP helps to improve the cardiac output, to improve the myocardial oxygen demand supply ratio. And IBP came out and we were started to taper the supports. But after that, we found that the LV function went down, the patient became febrile, we had to again increase the support. So always continuously assess the patient whether the support level needs to be increased or decreased. So post ECMO care has to be very good, otherwise you will lose patient in spite of winning the patient from ECMO. And once the x-rays were better, antibiotics worked, and we started again tapering inotropes, and the patient came off. Okay. So success of winning will depend primarily on the starting from before initiation of ECMO. So you have to choose the right candidate and use the right uh, time to put the patient on ECMO. Okay. Proper management of ECMO patient during the ECMO care maintenance, if the patient is bleeding, if the patient has, is having a hematoma, etc., all those complications will hamper your winning chances. And you have to be very vigilant about the timing of winning. Any window you get, get off the ECMO support. So because why timing of insertion is, uh, initiation is important? Because we know that for the heart, you are supporting the tissue perfusion only. Okay. So the tissue perfusion, if it is inadequate for a longer time, the more the number of non-cardiac organs get uh, affected and any hemodynamic shock will change into the hemometabolic shock. And at that time, initiation of ECMO is late and it will not be helpful. So initiate ECMO early so that you can wean off better. So weaning from VA ECMO, many patients can be weaned off. The weaning percentage varies from 31 to 76 percent, but many of these patients will, even after weaning, will lose, mainly because of a sepsis or any other causes. So, you have to be very careful even after weaning of these patients. One thing that you have to remember is that before weaning, assess the hepatic function because if the hepatic function has not improved, do not go for weaning. Renal function, may, the patient may continue to be on dialysis, but hepatic function should have improved before you start weaning. And once you put the patient on ECMO, VA ECMO, wait at least for 72 hours before 
you start winning. You have to give the heart some rest, have adequate tissue perfusion going for at least 72 hours, then only you go for winning. So, what are the criteria? You are coming down of, on the ECMO support and minimal ECMO support is needed. Pulse satellite of the waveform, arterial waveform has come back and their pulse pressure is at least 20. And the patient's hemodynamics, the blood pressures, mean arterial pressure should be maintained without use of very high supports. Moderate level of inotropic or vasopressor supports may be needed, but if the patient is needing higher supports to maintain the hemodynamics when you are coming down on the ECMO, then you hold back till the cardiac function improves further. And major metabolic uh, complications should have resolved and the lung function, because the VA ECMO is supporting both the heart and the lungs, it is also oxygenating, so the lung function should have improved before you start winning. So what we see is that ECMO flow is gradually reduced up to 1, 1 1.5 liters or sometimes even lower. You continue the heparin because you are coming down on the ECMO flow, blood flow, chances of the uh, clot formation in, in the oxygenator is there. So you continue heparin or increase the heparin dosage. You assess with the eco and the hemodynamics and also, the, in the echocardiography, what we see is aortic VTI, ejection fraction, and the right ventricular function through the TAPSA. Hemodynamic variables, what we see is whether the heart rate and rhythm are stable. There is no ectopics or uh, have started to appear, or the, if, if the heart, if there is sudden onset of arrhythmias, then you have to wait. That, the, that means the heart is not, taking to, uh, not able to take the load. See the blood pressure, filling pressures and SpO2. Check the mixed venous oxygenation and lactates. They are the indicators of tissue perfusion. And vasopressures and inotropic supports should not be increased to a very large extent. So if you are happy, if the patient has a myocardial recovery, and the patient has a map of more than 60, pulse satellite of the arterial waveform is there, lactate is less than two, PF ratio is more than 200. Why PF ratio? Because the lung function, it, this will give us the indication of the lung function. And after that, you see the eco, ejection fraction more than 20, 25%, VTI more than 12, or the tissue, uh, tissue Doppler that will uh, show the more than six millimeter, and you start the weaning process then. Okay. There are various other parameters that you see, and if the patient has a successful winning, go for uh, decannulation, go for a trial off, and if it is a failure, you have to consider to go back on ECMO fully and reconsider whether the patient, if the patient is not coming off ECMO after repeated trials, then you have to consider for any other kind of support is needed or not. Some patients may need an impella, some patients may need a durable VAD or a, even a heart transplant if the patient is a candidate. Okay. So if the patient have cardiac function has improved, but the lung is still wet or the patient has developed a pneumonia, what will you do? You have to go from cardiac support, VA ECMO to both heart and lung support VA, V ECMO, and then transition to VV ECMO till the patient is good enough so that we can win off the VV ECMO. Understood, this is a little bit difficult. VA ECMO, change over to VAV so that you can support the lungs also, and then take off the arterial support, go into VV purely, and when the lung function improves, go to V, uh, totally stopping the ECMO. So. When to trial off? When do you switch off the ECMO support? That, that means at least the 30%, the, a full, from the full ECMO support, you have come down to 30%, then you go for switching off the ECMO support. So when you go for uh, switching off the ECMO support for the trial off, we connect a bridge between the uh, drainage cannula and the return cannula. Why we connect a bridge? If we stop the flow totally, the oxygenator will clot. 
So we need to keep the circuit on. We clamp the cannula so that there is no blood flow going to the patient or coming from the patient. So the patient is disconnected from the ECMO circuit. But the ECMO circuit flow is maintained through the bridge. Okay. And you increase the anticoagulation settings. You release the clamps that we have shown previously. You release the clamps after every 15 minutes so that the blood in the cannula doesn't get clotted. After every 15 minutes for 10 to 15 seconds, you have to release the clamps. So then go for decannulation. If the patient is stable with the trial of the, with the bridge on and the cannulas are uh, clamped for uh, two to three hours maybe, then you can go for taking off the ECMO support fully. Shift the patient to the theater or sometimes even in the ICU we do it. So before I go to the VV uh, winning, I'll request uh, Dr. Kunal Sarkar. We uh, have been graced with his presence. He is the senior ca cardiac surgeon. He's the vice chairman of this institute. And he has been the guiding light of our ECMO program. Uh, without his support, our ECMO program would not have been what it is today. I'll request sir to come over to the stage for a few words. I don't think I know enough to go up on the stage, so I better stay below the stage. So uh, first of all, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, and I think uh, in spite of our rather punishing work schedule that includes everything from a six-year-old baby to a heart transplant, including our entire range of adult bodily work, I am uh, very, very, elated almost that our uh, team of cardiac commandos, our surgeons, our anesthetists, our perfusionists, our physician assistants, I don't call them a cardiac team, I call them a cardiac commandos who had the opportunity to uh, craft up such a wonderful training program. I think, you know, it was sometime in the year 2008 to 2007 in one of the American meetings, most probably in Boston, that I personally came in contact with, uh, became familiar with this technology. And I knew that we need to press on, we need to press on the initiative to establish it more. And it's been a long journey. And it's been a journey long enough that I almost had to switch cardiac institutions to uh, make this dream of advanced cardiopulmonary program possible. The pandemic has been a different kind of an exposure. It has been a big clinical blast. It has also been a huge clinical opportunity in some way. And I think we go on spreading the technology. We go on sharing with all of you the experience that our team has had, led by Orpon, Dipanjan, Devlal, Shwebal. They've been absolutely marvelous They've been like the SAS, Special Action Force. Uh, all of our young initiatives, Iraq, Little Portland, the entire team who's worked relentlessly to establish this program. And you know, knowledge always increases when we come forward to share it. The world is already looking at what lies beyond it, number one. Number two, it's very important to appreciate that what is going to be, start thinking today, that what is the next threshold of ECMO? The next threshold of ECMO is, A, making the initiation simpler clinically. And the next threshold of ECMO, with our help from industry, is going to be, you know, when I look at these people, Dipan, John, Orpon, Ritu, Parna, Hidok, all our people, what an enormous amount of time and effort goes in clinical and financial counseling. You know, the other healthcare services, the other healthcare systems. Uh, when I was in uh, Leipzig, when I spent a few days in Leipzig, uh, looking at how they initiate, you know, they don't, they don't have to spend even 
15 minutes thinking about this thing. The clinical decision is made, maybe one email or something on the other of the family, and the team goes on working about it. So today, our team, still today, has to spend longer in financial counseling, in social counseling, so that it absorbs into the family. And then, you know, probably counseling will take two, three hours. And their whole process of initiating it you know, will take 30 minutes, 20 minutes by the time they've initiated it. But that is our life. That is our reality. And we have to uh, live through this. But I think, you know, we cannot really stay in our little, little holes and imagine that we are very comfortable where we are because whenever you feel comfortable, because we, where, where the word comfortable ends lies another word, and that is the moment you feel comfortable, realize that we are actually being lazy. So the mind has to think, the body has to think that what are the next frontiers, and I think all of you young people with a little bit of guidance that we can give you uh, time and again. And I'm ever so happy that, you know, knowledge only prospers uh, when it spreads. That our entire team, with Dipanjan, Orpon, Devlal, Shoeba, and everyone, Hirok, Ritukorna, everyone, who <coughs> we just, you know, I think probably most of them have not slept for two nights. There's a heart transplant, which is not even extubated a few hours back. So they've been working through the time, making this program possible. They've never even thought for 10 minutes that they want to refer this program or shift this program. I really admire the kind of efforts they're putting in. I hope all of you gain. It's been wonderful to have you in Medica. Uh, the narrow confines of hospital institutions we are not clubs, we are not political partners. All these little divisions do not matter. We have to look beyond what is government, what is private, what is hospital A, what is hospital B. You know, this kind of thought process is absolute garbage. You know, don't even be limited about it. So come, work, empower yourselves, because we are in a challenging area, and none of us can enjoy the challenge till we are actually challenged. So you have to feel the heat. You have to feel the bullets. You know, unless you hear the sound of the bullets passing. You know, why does Croatia play football like that? Because the entire population has been on a battlefield for the good part of the last 12 years. So each one of them has probably been woken up by the sound of bullets and the sound of grenades and they are replicating the war on the football field and the soccer field. So it is your job now to take the war of resuscitation, advance cardiopulmonary support forward, and if we can be a little help in this mission, we will be grateful. And once again, thanks to the industry, thanks to all of our friends who made this morning possible, and welcome, and I'm sure clear all your doubts have frank discussions, and this should really be uh, a continuum progress, have more webinars, have more seminars, and uh, it's also a huge learning opportunity for all of us. So welcome, have a very good day, and hope to see you all back again sometimes. Thank you. Thank you, Department. <laughs>
continue to assess the blood, blood gas, continue to assess the hemodynamics, continue to see the echo, and after a couple of hours, if the patient is stable, you have to take off the cannula, or you need, if the patient is getting unstable, the lactate is rising, the tissue partition is getting hampered, then you have to again reinstitute ECMO by releasing of the clamp. And then clamp, we keep the bridge clamp. Any question from the last part, from the VA? Maybe around 10 to 15 minutes per amra comma te pari. And with each assessment, you, mane with coming down, you assess. Take a 15 minutes to half an hour, you take, you see whether the cardiac function is improving or not. If the cardiac function is not improving, you give more time. If the cardiac function has improved, uh, you can make it a little bit quicker. After after clamping, maybe a couple of hours. More than that, it, it makes the thing, uh, there is chances of clotting. <laughs> Don't worry. Now coming to the VV winning. I'll just give an example, another example of a case from beginning to the end, what we did and how we weaned the patient of what we assessed during weaning. So this was a 48-year-old <coughs> COVID patient. When it, the patient was obese, almost 120 kilos. The patient had a fever from 18th April, 21, and the next day the patient was admitted here with increasing oxygen requirement. And on 27th April, late evening, the patient got intubated and ventilated. After intubation and ventilation, we saw that the airway pressures were very high. We were not being able to ventilate the patient properly. Saturation, in spite of 100% oxygenation, was 78%. Heart rate was 133. BP was 168 upon 96. So the patient was having a sympathetic drive. And in spite of ventilation with 100% oxygen, PEEP of 14, tidal volume of 400, respiratory rate of 35. In, you cannot go up ventilation any further in this patient. Peak airway pressure was 56. This was a pre-intubation x-ray. <coughs> Very common for the COVID patients. And in the same night, after 12 o'clock, we spoke to the relatives and put the patient on ECMO. It was a femorojugular uh, ECMO, drainage, was a larger size cannula of 28 French, right femoral. Return was 20 French, uh, right jugular. And flow established was four liters and sweep of four liters. Initial sweep is always 100% oxygen. And we reduced the ventilation parameters, went on to the PCV mode, PEEP of 10, pressure control of 15, and rate of 14, FiO2 was made 60%. This was the X-ray post cannulation. You just pointer. You just watch the tidal volume. Okay, I'll show the ventilator graphic. This you just watch the tidal volume. I have kept the pressure of 15, pressure control of 15. You can see that the tidal volume is going down. Saturation was 92%, hemodynamics was maintained, and PO2 was 64, PCO2 was 55. We went up on the sweep. Sweep was 7 liters. At that time, we increased the sweep. The second day, the right lung got completely wiped out. Tidal volume went down to 69. We did a bronch, and this was the mucus plug that came out. This patient needed around four to six times bronch, and every time there was mucus plugging, we had to take it out. 
So after, on the third day after bronch, where they, the, you can see that the right lung has opened up. Tidal volume has gone up. There was an increased requirement of sweep. More than 10 liters, maximum we have done. And the flow was 4 liters. We cannot go up on the flow. RPM was 4,200. We changed the oxygenator at that time. We thought that the oxygenator may be failing and we changed it. This was the X-ray, serial X-rays after that. On the 3rd of May, you can see that the again X-rays are worsening. And this was on the 7th, the left lung getting white out. We again did a bronch. This was on the 9th, again the left side is white out. On 11th May, we did a tracky for this patient. Because we were thinking, as you have, we said previously, for the COVID patients, we did a delayed tracheostomy. Did a tracky on 11th. This was on 13th x-ray. And then we saw that the tidal volume started to go up with a pressure control of 14. Saturation started increasing. Okay. Hemodynamics maintained. Tidal volume more than 400. PO2 for the first time more increased to 150. So the ECMO is giving certain amount of oxygen, but once the lung starts functioning, you get an improvement in the oxygenation through the ABG. If you see the ABG, you will see there is a jump in the PO2 when the lung starts functioning. This was on the 14th X-ray improving on 16th we thought that the patient is overloaded the fluid needs to come down we started diuretics and then on from the 16th you started to reduce the oxygen in the ECMO the sweep gas oxygen started to come down you can see that the pointer is to the 30 percent then it was reduced to 21 percent but the sweep gas levels we were not taking down as fast. Okay. Then on 19th, we did a CO2 challenge. This is the deoxy challenge test, where if the lung is functioning well, you reduce the oxygenation through the ECMO. That is a deoxy challenge test. And then CO2 challenge, where we reduce the sweep. We have learned previously the oxygen part in that uh, sweep gas that determines the PO2. But the PO, PCO2 is determined by the, our sweep gas, how much is the flow. So we started to come down on the sweep gas flow. Okay, Sweep gas of one liter of PCO2 was 45. Sweep was zero. That means we are practically off ECMO. And PCO2 was still 45. We had to go up on the tidal volume uh, and increase the ventilation to normal ventilation from the rest ventilation setting to normal ventilation setting. And on the next day, the patient was decannulated. This was the x-ray on 24th and on 27th, the patient tracheostomy was decannulated and then discharged. So what we did is we reduced the sweep gas FDO2, that is a deoxy challenge test by blender control. We are reducing from the blender and reduce the sweep gas rate. After that, we are reducing the sweep gas rate by reducing from this. So this is the blender. This is the blender and this gives the flow of gas. So these two are different. This determines the oxygen, this determines the CO2. So like if the lung is not functioning properly, uh, you go, if the PCO2 is high on ABP, what we do on ventilation is we increase the minute volume. So like the minute volume, minute ventilation, this is the sweet gas rate. And if the PO2 is low, we go up on the FiO2. So that is given by the blender. So progressively, we are decreasing initially the FDO2 and then we are reducing the sweep gas. And at the same time, 
we are increasing the ventilation. And always connect an ETCO to monitor if you have to the patient when you are coming down on the sweep gas. Because there can be increase in the PCO2 levels and the patient may become drowsy because of the increased PCO2. That you have to monitor. You cannot do ABG every hour. You have to keep the PCO2, assess the PCO2 by the ETCO2 monitor. So at zero fresh gas flow, the patient is effectively off ECMO. Why effectively off ECMO? Do you have that? So there is a circle movement. Whatever oxygenation is taking place is taking place in the lungs. It is because of ECMO both, but the flow is we are maintaining at three liters blood flow. But the sweep gas flow we are reducing to zero. And sweep are if I look more the difference. Sweep means total total. Total patient. Total patient. Total Sweep what say? Jay Kotoka gas jacks. How much is the total volume of gas in, oxygen. But in the oxygen? That can be oxygen, that can be mere uh, 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 oxygen air mixture. How much is the mixing is determined by the blender and the, uh, how much is the total gas? And a minute ventilation to me to the baratech of Ibarach, the tidal volume of the red baratech. So the rate and tidal volume, a can a shader corollary would say the sweetness. Okay. So if if you have a deoxygenated blood coming out of this drainage cannula and the same deoxygenated blood going into the return cannula, there is no oxygenation in the circuit because the sweep gas is zero. So this is the blood which is coming here in the right atrium will be the same concentration of oxygen and CO2 that is in the venous returns. And this blood will go through the RV to the pulmonary circuit, getting uh, uh, gaseous exchange and going to the left ventricle. So whatever uh, ABG that you are doing after that is that the how much is the lung function is there that will be noted in our ABG. So a simplistic way. First is you have to see whether that there is a disease resolution or not. How we are assessing disease resolution? By improvement of compliance. We are keeping on pressure control, see the tidal volume going up. If we are on volume control, we see the plateau pressure, peak pressure coming down. So one is the lung function improvement is assessed by the compliance, the x-rays, the ABG, all these three things you have to see. Okay, so they will give us an idea of whether the lung function is improving or not. And if the patient is spontaneously breathing or not, patient ke awake kore, as we have seen previously, we put the patient on pressure support and see whether the patient is breathing properly or not. Huh? Huh. So this is the blender where, if you can focus here, there is an arrow mark which will show how much is the oxygen percentage, okay? And this is the sweet gas rate, when you control it by this, this knob. And there are two <coughs> causes, one goes to the oxygen uh, uh, line and other is to the yeah. air. They get mixed up here and the total volume of gas that is coming, going to the oxygenator will be shown by this flow meter. Flow meter is the total volume of gas that is reaching the oxygen. And the, how much is the percentage of oxygen there that is controlled by this? Eta of the sweep. Eta of the MDO, FIO2 of the ECMO oxygen. 
if since the patient's lines are out, the patient will be more actively doing physiotherapy and mobilization. And gradually you come down on the ventilatory support and take off the ventilatory support as uh, the patient permits and allow the patient to do whatever he wants, like reading a book even, to, so that he is happier during that period. And if the patient has, again, the lung function goes down, suddenly be prepared for a re -ecmo. Don't leave the patient, he's a precious patient. So the key words is always patience, perseverance, and vigilance. These three words will uh, will sum up all your activities during it. Thank you from a co team of medical. Thank you very much, sir. Any questions? Very less, very less. If you are careful enough, the, the chances of re is very less. Not, not zero. But less, very less. Chagging or chattering? Chagging or chattering? You want to see? Just a minute. The drainage, drainage line that has, if their if their flow reduces, the drainage line starts to shake. You can see that we are not shaking it; it is shaking on itself. Okay, because the vein is slightly collapsing on the cannula, so the flow starts fluctuating. And you can see that the your RPM is kept constant, but the flow is constantly going up and down. So if you read it, what do you do what, when, when you have the shattering? One of the causes of increased chattering is because we are on very high RPM. Okay, that is creating a large negative pressure. First and foremost, we come down on the RPM a little bit and see whether the chattering is gone. Many a times with the reduction of RPM, the flow improves. That is, you don't go up on the RPM first. You go down on the RPM and see. This chattering is going on. You can see the flow from the flow as well as from the tubing, you can see. And if with the reduction of RPM, it is not improving. Check the cannula position. If the cannula position is not okay, then you have to reposition it. Or if the patient is having a reduced preload, the hypovolemic because of bleeding or anything else, see the, you can see the 
the movement, this is called chugging or chattering. It is going on automatically, so no one is doing it. If the preload is low, then you have to give volume. Given 100 ml, uh, giving 100 ml volume, and just see the flow. Uh, if uh, if you have uh, another line, you give from other, another line. Ekhane amra ekmo circuit a diyechi because the chatting was very severe and needed to go up on the flows fast. See, after 100 ml of volume, the chattering. How do you assess preload in this condition? Whether the patient will need volume or not, you can just do the simple straight leg drive and see whether the patient is, is going out. Or okay. Any questions? that is needed that you give either cryo or FFP or platelets. If the patient is having a GI bleed, you have to go for uh, endoscopy and you have to close the bleed there. Okay. So major bleed incidence is not very high but at least 5 to 10 percent of the patients will have. And heparin, you be very careful. At that time, you may need to go down on the heparin and increase the blood flow. If you do not increase the blood flow in the ECMO circuit, then the circuit may drop. How to tighten the heparin? Uh, by, by APT. We tightened it by APT. So, but uh, how? How much down? If, we, we some, <coughs> if, if it's a major bleed, you have to stop the heparin and go up on the flow. If it is the flow is more than 4, 4.5 liters, the circuit won't clot. Chances of clotting is less. Okay. Regional circuit is anticoagulation. Regional anticoagulation. Because we need anticoagulation in the both in the side. Side anticoagulation, side after decoagulation, after 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 why not uh, flexan or uh, LMWS or that? That also you can give. But if it's a profile axis, yes, you, can, you can give flexan. Right. Okay. So, sir, if the sweep is 0, percent blood flow. If sweep is 0, whatever uh, blender is there, I will not touch it. If the blood flow is 0, I will not touch it. Now, blood flow has to be kept continuous. Jaa chilo, three, four meters. Jaa blood flow ko chilo, blood flow the hati do kona. Now, the decalibration kora na thi. Decalibration kora na just clamp, 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 clamp and take out. Now, only only blood loss. Ha, only 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 so they are Michi and Michi. So during the beginning, Jokun between FIO 100% and Jokun 40% and Jokun 40% During meaning FIO 2 Jokun, when we are reducing the FIO 2 and oxygen challenge. Oxygen challenge. When we are doing the ventilator, at least 5 minutes. At least 5 minutes gap between the making the FIO 2 100% and then doing the ventilator. What is the significant rise? 30 kPa, that means at least 200 if the PO2 rises. From at least 40% to 100%. And a 40% if I have to do, will go up on the 100%. So what is the initial RPM to be Initial RPM is depending upon the flow that you will need. Flow, you, you cannot set the 
target RPM, it is always the flow. It will automatically adjust. It will automatically adjust. But if you see, feel that the RPM is needing is too high for that machine. Every machine has different pump that you will see, and the RPM for that uh, flow will be different for every mm -hmm. machine. So if you, if you are adjusted to one kind of pump, if you feel that if this patient is needing too high RPM for the same flow, then you have to see whether the your cannula, drainage cannula is proper or not, the patient is needing volume or not, but the preload you have to increase or not, all those things you have to assess. If the patient is on a BP ECMO and uh, due to high RPM, then BP should fall, then uh, can you change to VA ECMO? If, uh, See, if the, if the patient is on BP ECMO and there is a shock, you are asking about this question. So, what is the cause of shock? Treat the cause of shock. Okay, so if it is a cardiogenic shock or something like that, you give aerotropes and vasopressors and see. Okay, if it is septic shock, the outcome of septic shock with VA ECMO is not good unless the cardiac function is too low, less than 20% ejection fraction, or if it is a pediatric patient. It's only in these two conditions where you convert from VV to VVA. Other than that, do not go for VA support in sepsis. If the patient's cardiac function is good and the patient is hypotensive because of sepsis, do not go for ECMO support. And what is the role of IVP in case of VVA? See, we have used a IVP in a couple of patients if the patient's cardiac function is good. Only, only there. Other than that, uh, very less. If the patient's cardiac function is low, only there. You are adding a mechanical circulatory support. What is the indication? The indication is only when the cardiac function is the patient is in cardiac uh, If we, we will prefer to, if the patient is in uh, uh, cardiac shock, we will prefer to go to a VBA. Previously, it was VB, you add arterial limb. So it becomes VBA. It is same as VAV. When VA was the first configuration, you would add a venous. The same cannulation is same, but that nomenclature changes depending on which was done first, which was done later. Return to the house. Let's move to our workshop. That is the part where we are. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And put outside for very interesting session. Hands on session, please.
and uh, the patient is shifted to us and we are planning to go forward. Okay, he is Dr. Hirok. He has received the call. He is our ECMO physician and uh, he is the patient relative who came to us with the clinical summary. And please explain uh, we have received the patient and how you are going to proceed on this patient. He is the relative. So uh, first, uh, first he demonstrated why it is required. Now he is asking how long it is required. Every counselling has three parts. Okay, first is the why we are putting him on ECMO. Second is the expected duration of ECMO. What he has rightly asked. Please ask. Initial uh, uh, stage, uh, uh, initiate uh, uh, 
His blood pressure is 110 by 70. His saturation is 76 on proning. His airway pressure is uh, 46 with 100% of oxygen. And his uh, PO2 is 49 and PCO2 is 66. So this is the uh, uh, pH is 7.18 uh, and lactate is 1.2. So what, what is the consensus of uh, the, So you want to go for BVF. So somebody of you, please volunteer. Uh, uh, if, if you can volunteer, he is a patient. He came to uh, you as a proning uh, condition. OK, so what is your plan? Uh, how you are planning to put him on it? You are the uh, ECMO specialist uh, poster over here. They don't press that DNA. Just tell loudly so that everybody can see. After the consent is uh, available, uh, suppose I am a part of the ECMO specialist. You are an ECMO specialist. Okay. Uh, Another four hours, you will be ECMO specialist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sir, uh, if this patient is there for inclusion of ECMO, we will procure the things that is necessary for us, uh, including the cannulas and all. Okay. So you have this uh, thing is ready. You are in ECMO center yeah. who has done 300 ECMOs. Okay, everything is there, procured and everything is done. Okay, so don't think about the procurement and all this. Thing. You just tell what we are going to do with this with him. Sir, uh, I will look at this for For what? You are putting Benavena ECMO. Are you planning to do anything? Uh, so suppose any hemorrhage complications occur. So, if at all. So how the CTBS team is going to help? What is going to help? So then? Uh, actually, I am not very versed in putting up the ECMO line. I told you, you are ECMO specialist. You can put it. So <laughs> what is, yes, you are right, you are. You are skeptical of the complications. Okay. So what you are going, to, what is going to help you before the CTBS? Suppose you are putting the ECMO where the CTBS surgeon has gone on leave. Okay. So I will check the basic population parameters. Okay. Uh, the basic blood, uh, blood panel I will check. Okay. How it is going to help you in the cannulation? Sir, if the population parameters are extremely deranged, I will try to first correct them initially before put I am not expecting anything population parameter. It's H1N1, fresh case, five days, H1N1, ventilated today, patient got shifted here. So no uh, population parameter. What is what is your just order the things. Don't think theoretically, just order the things. Uh, sir, I will try to secure an IGB and a line. Before that you want to do something? Okay. Eco cardiogram you have to do. Fine. What you are going to see? Yes, sir, the cardiac contact has to be start with. Fine. And so no, that's fine. You see the cardiac contact activity and some people see the vessel size also with that. Okay, you want to cannula. Second one, what you are going to do? After taking the consent. Very important, I have told it. Yes. yes, you have to give at least two units of ignition. Cardiac surgeon will not help, the blood will come to help. Okay, so just go for two units of blood requisition, at least looking at the hemoglobin of the patient and go for check echo. Okay, everybody is clear with that thing? Minimum thing to put him on echo. Make it simple. Technique. Don't make it the, uh, such a thing that it's a niche thing and can't be done without a cardiac surgeon or this thing. Okay. So, simple VV ECMO you are going to put and uh, the patient is in front of you. Okay. He is prone. You are planning to patient. You want to do him supine? When? After the, after, uh, do you want to... Uh, Make him supine now or after blood is ready, you are getting ready over there. Sir, after I have blood is in there, all the sets are there in my okay. then I will Just before cannulation, you are to. So this has to be learned because he is somehow maintaining oxygenation on prone. Okay, you don't know what will get going to happen when you are making him supine. He's so sick. Okay, so don't make him supine and go for taking consent because in between the consent, the news will come, he got arrested. Okay, keep it as usual what he is maintaining on. Okay, now you are deciding you have to cannulate the patient. Okay, now you want to make him supine. Please, supine, somebody supine him, please. Come. Okay. So how many, how many? Okay. So that is most important. Okay, as we have taken the consent, now 
the game is on. Okay. Now all these supination problems and all these things will be attributed to it. Okay. Just make it supination. So with four or five people, you are going to. So then. Some help uh, to take for cannulation. How many people want uh, you want for cannulation? What are the cannulas you want to put? Femoral cannula. Or what are they now? What are the picture? This is your kitty. This is your kitty. Conta by femoral venous. Which cannulas you want to put? I will use this for the femoral uh, cannula, which will drain the blood. And I will be. This is 16. Sorry, it is 16 inch and can be used for the IUGB and So this is your. Uh, this is what? This is your drainage yeah. cannula. Yeah. Longer is a drainage cannula. He has uh, chosen it for as a drainage cannula. And this is the. Return cannula. Yes. We are going to put a femoral jugular axis. So after that, what you are going to do? Sir, I will have a rough idea of the length that I need to put it from the femoral side. Not now. Okay. Now you have to. What are the places you have to drape? Sir, I will drape the. I have a I have a femoral line. You have a femoral line in the left joint, and you have a radial line in the right femoral. Uh, right radial artery. Sir, I will try to put a uh, right femoral uh, venous axis. And? and for drainage. For drainage. And? And a right IJV for uh, the return. Return. Okay, oh, fine. Now, you, you want to put the patient on a... Just pause. You want to put the patient on a... You are an ECMO specialist. Please go on that side. Take it, take it. Camera cut it. Instruct him how he is going to prepare the things. So, what are the places to be prepared for ectopic? Sir, I first I have to take the access sites to be sterile. Okay. So, IJB and the femoral I have to make it. So, that you have told. What are the places to be painted? Sir, up to umbilicus to make time. Okay. For the femoral access. Okay. Both side or? So here, the lesson is you have to paint both sides. You don't know whether you are going to get a neckline or not. You might change your plan. If you are not getting a good femoral uh, access, you can make it femoral femoral loss. Your planning is to do that. But you might have a uh, clot over in the right IJB, uh, long sitting clot. Okay, then you can't do it. So paint it, paint four areas. Okay, right groin, left groin, right neck, left neck. Okay, because if you have to put a bilateral thing, you have to change this cannula over here. You need to change that triple lumen here. So always paint four pieces. <coughs> Got the point? All painted. Fine. Now, how he is going to cannula? Just tell me. Instructing how he is going to cannula. What are the procedures of cannulation? Sir, I have an USG process. Okay, fine. You have to do an USG guided thing. There are things. Which we have uh, to use. Okay. So, 
this is your set you have chosen. So there is a puncture needle and a guide wire. So you want to puncture it with the set. There is a uh, puncture needle and the guide wire with a serial dilators. We do use serial dilators. Okay. The first puncture is with the needle and then the guide wire. Okay. Then you do the, how do you cannulate that? Okay. So you want to dilate on the same dilator, or on the same guide wire, or do you want to exchange with a longer guide wire? Because this requires a longer guide wire. Sir, it depends. This requires a longer guide wire. You, know? you want to exchange it with that? You want to exchange with a longer guide wire. Fine. So, do we have any longer guide wire? So this is the longer guide wire. Once your first guide wire is in, you have to push the longer guide wire with the dilators. Okay, because this is a long guide wire, you have to put for the, the bigger guide wire. Okay, so up to this, this guide wire will be like this. Okay, then you cannulating by serially dilating with those dilators. Okay, and after that, what? How you are going to put the, this cannula? Please check the length. Okay. Uh, please check the length. Please check the no, not with this. Please. please check the length. Checking the length always requires to take out that key out. Otherwise, you can't check the length. What is the length actually? This is the tail tail uh, uh, from uh, femoral to zipi sternum. This is your drainage camera. Okay, everybody is agreed with this femoral to zipi sternum. And then you put the guard over here, yeah. or with that cannula, you have to check the marking point. Okay, usually it comes around 40. Just keep it. Okay. Okay, everybody has to see the marking. Yeah? Usually comes the. Here you have a garden facility, here you don't have, you just make it uh, over here. Got the point? Okay. Now you have secured your venous cannula. Okay. Next, what you are going to do? Are we missing something? We have cannulated a bigger cannula and we have not done something. We have, uh, no, we have checked the clot and potency it is painted, but whether we have to give some other instruction to anybody want to give? Okay. No, heparin is solution for flushing. You want to give something? I have asked you. Okay, how much heparin you want to give? He is uh, 50 kg. You want to give 50 mg Are you all agreed with the 50 mg heparin? 1 mg per kg heparin? Now, when you want to give the heparin? Somebody is cannulating from here, somebody is cannulating from the neck. Both guide wire is in and they are started dilating. Okay. When you want to give the heparin? After putting the guide wire in or putting the cannula in, what is your plan? After putting the heparin. Any, any reason for that? So the ideal teaching is you have to give heparin after give, putting the guide wire. Okay. But most of the time it happens that after guide wire you give heparin and you can't cannulate on that same vessel, it keeps on bleeding. That's a problem. So what we do in Venovena Secmo, we do postpone our heparin administration so once the last dilatation is over. Before pushing the cannula in, we just give the heparin. So that will make at least some comfort that this area is not going to bleed if you don't can't dilate. Okay, so any confusion up to that? So have we cannulated the patient? Cannulated. Now this jugular cannula and the femoral cannula is in place. Okay, now Then if you are alone, okay, the idea is to put two guide wires first, then cannulate one by one. 
Okay. If you have two people doing simultaneously thing, you can follow it. If you are alone, you have to cannulate, put the guide wire there, put the guide wire here, then you start cannulating. Don't cannulate one by one. What the point? That will minimize your heparin problems and the cannulation issues. Okay. Now, both cannulas are in place. Okay. Both are clamped and you have cannulated. Now, what is your plan? Next plan. Circuit is prime? Yes, yes. yes. Please, yes. please bring that circuit. So you have to tell your team that prime the circuit. Sir, cannulation done? Now, circuit priming is our first. Circuit is prime. What is priming and what is? When you ask for the priming, what is priming? Virtually the line thing, you know. Priming is Radi means what? Circuit yeah. radi. What is the what is the difference between circuit is radi and what is the difference between circuit is prime? So are you sure that you can calculate this patient? Not yet. So when you are going to be prime, this circuit has to be prime. Yes. So idea is when you are starting your things, ask him to be get ready with the yes, thing. Yes. Okay. Don't get primed until unless you are you are comfortable with the calculation. Okay. Then you ask for the prime. Okay. Ask him for the prime. Hello, the to Hello, Priming to start for Ready to start started. Give me two minutes. So starting our priming. So something with. Uh, on ML or 50 milligram heparin, steroid priming done with NS, circuit priming ready and DR also. Uh, now line hold up. Rajiv, take the line. Line hold up. Line hold up. Our circuit is prime. Line hold up. Line hold up. Line hold up. Every point is important. Line hold up, please. So, uh, you want to keep the machine on the left side or the right side? Seizure. Left seizure. Left seizure. They are preparing on the left side. Which side you want to keep it? What is your calculation? Right side. Right side. Okay. Ask him where you are to keep this side. Right side. Koival. He is the ECMO station. He is asking to push the thing on the right side. Why you want to want in the right side? Okay. Yes, the line with unnecessary cloth for the patient. You can't manage it. So the thing has to attach to it. So things will be on the right side. That's fine, that's fine. Right side. Okay. okay. So you have to fix it. That is also important. Why that is important? That fixing is important. Because it can happen after connecting with that line, you don't care about this thing, the weight of the circuit will take all the cannulas from the bottom. You have to not secure it. So most important, after putting the patient you have to secure the cannulas and the, you have to put that line holder over there on the bed, you have to fix it and then 
to take the lines. Okay. So he is you are you are the guy who is taking the lines. Now you plan how to do that. This is your uh, plan. Steril cap. Steril cap. You do steril cap day. Do me that. Ask. You want to take something? Clamp for that. I am not going to do that. That is already clamped. Otherwise, the blood will come out. Do it now. What are you doing? Why are you clamping over there? It is already fixed. It is already. Don't. What is your plan? What is your plan? You have a cannula here. Okay. You want to connect the venous line. So connect, cut it and connect. No, no, no. Samrata Siri, Samrata. Samrata Siri. I'm, I'm just, I'm just interrupting. Just, just. This is your return mode. This is your image. Okay. You have to connect it looking at the length where you, where you want to cut. Okay. So why are you clamping here? To cut it and to clamp it, where actually? How many clamps you need? Total four. Just place it. Place those clamps. Yes, so that is the thing. Another two clamps, <coughs> where you want to put it? Here is the camera. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Please watch it. This is the practical issue. Okay? What is your venous leak? This is your, this is your arterial leak or return leak. Okay. And after that, cut. Where, where you are coming? Okay. This is this is connected. Connected. 
this show where you are connecting the oxygen. Somebody show, please. Oxygen connection is here, sir. Okay. Where is it connected? Oxygen connection? This is the blender outlet. This is the oxygen inlet. Okay. Which be alert? The oxygen inlet. CO2 removal push is a gas outlet. You cannot block here. This one is a gas outlet. You always remove it. This one is a gas inlet. So the gas is... Okay. Just make it... 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 How much oxygen you have to connect? How much oxygen you have to connect? Sweet and biodude. One liter. So start with one liter sweet with 100% of biodude. Okay, we don't go with three liter of this. Okay, idea is to reach one is to one thing. If three liter is your flow, you have to give three liter of sweet. Okay, but you don't jump to three liter sweet because what happens at CO2 sink washes immediately there is a chance of intracranial hemorrhage so go for one liter why I start from one and then go to the three what happens if you drastically down the CO2 by increasing three liter of thing it can lead to an central hemorrhage so slowly you have to go up in the sweet gas start with one liter hundred percent oxygenation you can increase immediately but carbon dioxide removal adds load. 1 liter 100%, then 15 20 minutes or take half an hour, make it 2 liter 100%, then another half an hour, make it 3 liter 100%. If you are giving 3 liter flow, huh? you can check the ABG. Don't let the CO2 goes down. Like what happens if you start 3 liter of flow and 3 liter of FiO2 as this uh, sweep. The patient PCO2 is 66. It will, that's a very good lung, na? he was breathing on this bad lung. The CO2 you will find 15, 15, from 66 to 15. And that will lead to a severe cerebral vasodilatation, uh, constriction scenario, which will lead to cerebral hemorrhage. So this has been a depicted uh, evidence, 11% of EDFO patients had cerebral hemorrhage because of this sudden decrease in the CO2. Don't let the CO2 come down so fast. If you, after putting on ECMO, if you found your CO2 is not came down, Take time to address it. Don't reduce it immediately. Got the point? Sometimes it happens the CO2 is 100. You are putting the patient on ECMO. Let it go down to 60 over a period of 2 to 3 hours. Don't target 40 suddenly within an hour because it will lead to sudden cerebral problems. Oxygenation you target immediately with 100%. Okay, so that is the idea of increasing the thing. As the uh, flow will increase, see, from 1500, uh, the thing is going to increase. So why it is 1500? Why it is not 500 or 1000? Why we start from 1500? Chances of clotting? Why? There is no chances of clotting. Why we started from 1500? There is a red mark over there. Why it is 1500 is a red mark? Yeah? Yes. So if below 1500, because it's a passive pump, okay, centrifugal pump is a passive pump. If you do allow that thing to da go down, it will actually flow the retrograde. Gola thake tene debe Okay, so that is the way 1500 take that is the first the gear concept applies here. Okay, first gear, second gear, third gear. So, so some amount of force has to be applied to maintain the forward flow. Okay, then only the car will move. First gear on gari move corona. Then uh, that thing goes move after go second, third, and this thing. So this is the 1500 is the basic flow you require to run the circuit forward. Okay, so for each machine you have a uh, flow target where the red flag is there, below which you cannot go. Because the artery theke, uh, return cannula theke, uh, that flow will go. Okay, back flow. Okay. Uh, uh, different company has different uh, uh, setup. Okay. More or less around that. More or less around that. Okay. Yeah.
So if his cardiac output, if, uh, you just calculate his cardiac output is 4 liters, you are giving flow of 2.8 liters. Okay, so almost 70% flow you are giving and you are looking at the oxygen saturation. It was uh, 56, 57. It is slowly coming up to more than 85. What is our target saturation in VV ECMO? No. Target saturation in VV ECMO is more than 85. Okay. Got it. If you get a good saturation, that is fine. If you are struggling with the saturation, then tar maintain target. Maintain is more than 85. VV ECMO target saturation is more than 85. For safer thing, we try to maintain around 90. Okay. So, 4 liter of cardiac output, you are giving 2.7, 2.8 flow, which is good flow on its own. Okay. So, now what is your, now what is your direction to them? You are on ECMO, patient is stabilized, the saturation is 91 on 2.8 liter of flow, 2000 RPM is acceptable thing. Now, what are the things are going to, you are going to tell your uh, colleagues to do? Sir, I will get an EBG. Okay. Okay. Immediately APTT. We don't do that. We do ACT. Okay. Point of care testing. ACT machine is there. You will get that ACT over there. Okay. ACT. Then you want to do an ABG. On ABG, what else you want to see? Okay. Hemoglobin. Very nice. Hemoglobin. How much hemoglobin you want to keep? Above 7. Above 7. We initial ECMO, we want to keep around 9 to 10. Okay. At least more than 10. Then? Gases. Gases. PO2. 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 Ah. Ah. Bicarb and pH. Okay. Start with pH. Okay. No, electrolyte is fine. So that is the thing you want to. And what, what if you see the is, is uh, PCO2 is 75, even after this amount of flow and 1 liter of sweep, what you are going to do? You have to increase the sweep. So, it will make it 1 to 2 liter. Then do an ABG again. Okay. Then, if it is 60, then you want to go another further for 3 liters and targets uh, PCO2 is around 40 to, between 40 to 50. So, that is the thing you want. Anything more you want to do? Now, now suddenly you see, after putting the patient on ECMO, there is a small, uh, sudden, uh, slowly bradycardia is happening. Why it is happening? What we have not done? Okay. So, you have checked the temperature. Temperature is 31.2. So, what you have not done? That is not the warmer. That is known as hemotherm. Okay. Then you have to? Check the hemotherm temperature. And keep it above 35. Fine. So, you want to make it slightly hypothermia. For these patients. No, okay. Okay. Gradually, try to Gradually go on to up to 36, 37. Okay, so you want to connect the temperature probe. Anything else you want to do? Immediate advice? Huh? ECG to aara hai to monitor me aara ECG. He sedated, well sedated, paralyzed. You have not changed anything. You have given extra paralyzing agent during cannulation. Then? Chest X-ray. Hmm? No, no, no. Just think, think about the ECMO thing. This is an ECMO workshop, na? This, just think, what else? Huh? Sir, T, sir, T no, no, no. We are thinking about the patient. I don't want to think about the patient. Just think about the ECMO thing. The chamber, what I have told, just, just think in the morning what salient points I have told. If the blood comes out of the body, two things we have to do. Maintain the temperature and anticoagulation. You have stopped, you have forgotten to start heparin infusion. Okay, because you have given the bolus. Now one hour is over. You know, who is going to anticoagulate the uh, thing? It will get it clotted, no? So start heparin infusion at least how much it should be? No, 1000 units per hour. It's 100 units to, uh, per hour, at least 100 to 200. Check ACT after that, maintain ACT around 160 to 180 for that. And after 24 hours, the APTT should be 1.5 to 2 times. Okay. So, uh, so here we end our uh, 
डिस्कशन अच्छा फिजियो और आचे नाउ द सेकंड क्या क्या आचे रियोन आचे ओके सो कैनोला आचे कैनोला आचे ओके नाउ जस्ट वन टू सिनेरियोस वी वांट टू शो यू द पेशेंट इज नॉन इम्प्रूविंग ऑन एक्मो इज लंग इज वर्सनिंग यू वांट टू प्रोन ऑन एक्मो एंड द पेशेंट इज अवेक यू हैव डन द ट्रेकियोस्टोमी यू वांट टू डू फिजियोथेरेपी ऑन एक्मो दिस टू थिंग्स विल बी डेमोन्स्ट्रेटेड ओके फर्स्ट इज दिज सुपाइन हाउ डू यू डू फिजियोथेरेपी वॉट आर द फिजियोथेरेपी थिंग्स वी डू ऑन एक्मो दैट हैज टू बी सीन रियन प्लीज कम पेशेंट इज ट्रेकिस्टोमाइज ओके जस्ट डू द फिजियोथेरापी व्हाट यू आर गोइंग टू डू आई चोक खोले वाले ना पैरालाइज नहीं ही इज अवेक वी हैव डन ट्रेकिस्टोमी वी आर डे एट ऑफ एक्मो डे एट ऑफ एक्मो तो अच्छी डे एट ऑफ एक्मो इम्प्रूविंग पेशेंट two scenarios one is improving patient one is non improving okay. patient okay improving patient we have to do physiotherapy how we do that hmm. so first we start from the lower extremity so um yeah hello so we start from <coughs> so first we start from the foot yeah. we do a passive uh, an active ankle foot pump for both the legs together so we go lower to upper distal first then we go proximal so we start with the foot up and down ankle pumps followed by isometric quadriceps squeeze count to 10 and relax then followed by finger movement so we go distal to proximal and then we go a little bit of elbow movement as well so once the patient is able to move her the limbs independently then we go so cycle in then we start the cycling on bed cycling on the bed in a supine position in a supine position yeah. head up position <coughs> so we place the cycle from some, somewhat like this <coughs> See, the problem with that doing physiotherapy is keep in mind you have a cannula here and you have a cannula here Okay, so, so need this has to be helping. yeah, you need helping. Yeah. Whatever you do, at least you need three, four people. So Vijay is the uh, nursing uh, is doing. He is asking for help. Uh, the session for physiotherapy will be on now. Okay, so what he is going to do? He is going to secure the cannulas at that point of time. Hmm. Okay, which no all like and somebody will. from the perfusion team uh, or the eco okay. specialist team will fix the cannula over there okay okay cannula and the, uh, cannula like and the thing so that it should not get dislodged okay so how many people are required just to see ha it is sick ha it ek hi it ek hi hai it will niche chala ha theek hai tu ekon pa na to apne tu rak pa ta just uh, just keep it like this hmm. so somebody has to fix the cannula neck and this thing okay uh, the uh, groin somebody has to fix the connections with the pump because that is the lifeline the patient is leaving and he will checking the flow somebody the person who is looking at the connection and he will check the flow okay because with that thing there might be changes in your volume status okay the uh, there may be proximal or the distal dislodgement of the cannulas that can lead to the flow fluctuations you cannot afford that if it any flow fluctuation happen during the physiotherapy you have to stop the physiotherapy to prevent that thing should we uh, decrease the stress on this cannula no we don't we, you can't it because uh, already you have fixed it okay Obviously, in the morning hours. How many days? When patient is awake, patient is at least you have great three power all the way. And any ECMO parameter, ventilator parameter required? Yes, patient should be comfortable when he is awake. Some patients after getting awake become so restless you can't do physiotherapy on that. Okay, patient is stable, he is 
actively taking part on that, explain things to him first, and then you do all this. Okay, I told you patient is improving, we are going to take out the ECMO, most likely for another two to three days, but he is losing his body mass, and he can't uh, uh, do this, uh, elevate his limb, and he, uh, we are afraid of getting this neuromuscular weakness. So we want to do the physiotherapy. What are the way we are breaking? Usually, uh, we start, like I said, the anti-prompt, the isometric, this is the neuromuscular. There's a lot of deconditioning, there's a lot of atrophy in the muscles as well. So, just to prevent that, we focus on isometrics first, and then when the patient is able to move his hands and legs, then we go on with active movements and active assistive movements. We also make sure that the patient is able to clear his lungs. Secretion clearance is also an important part. So how do you do that? Chest percussion is... Huffing and coughing. Encourage chest huffing. Chest exercises and chest expansion. Exercise. Both you have to do simultaneously. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the breathing exercises, the chest expansion, you have to do it continuously. Keeping in mind, he is an ECMO physiotherapist. He knows Everything he can do in that patient, but keeping in mind all the cannulas are in position yes. and flow is maintaining because this patient is dependent on that machine. So you have to keep in mind all the cannulas in place. Okay. Now the second scenario is the patient is non-improving. We want to prone the patient. Okay. Now our proning team is here. We want to prone him and. Uh, no, uh, you have not tracheostomy, but on ECMO patient. Proning a tracheostomy patient is a bit tricky, but we have done it. The courage, it will just get a good tool. Tracheostomy also prone to the most skill. It's a good job. Absolutely, absolutely difficult, but it can be done. Take it, take it. The most important thing while proning any any patient, first you ensure that the eyes are taken care properly. Take it. So what we prefer to do is we first close the eyelids with micropore. After that we put padding on that and then we cover it with roller bandage. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Arterial line, right radial line, right radial line, right radial arterial line, left femoral, triple lumen, right neck, return cannula, right femoral, drainage cannula. Okay. I dropped. So we put eye drop, we close the eye, eye has been taken care of, now, Achha. of the monitors we just like to keep attached the uh, arterial line, rest of the monitors are usually detached, okay, uh, to ease the movements. machine so we will first take him towards the right, then we will turn. Okay. Stop. 
ঠিক আছে
लेग्स ऑफ द पेशेंट एंड वी शिफ्ट ये तो देख ही रहते हैं बस शिफ्टिंग वी हैव अ शिफ्टिंग स्टैंड एसएलआई शिफ्टिंग स्टैंड तो कुछ स्टैंड आता है एक तो खानी है बोर्ड तो थोड़े एक तो तू चलो हाँ बस ठीक है सर हाँ प्लेस दिस यार एंड ऑक्सीजनेटर ठीक है सर हाँ और पादू तो आला लगा एक जोन ब्रैकेट तक खोल प्लीज ओप Mobilize somebody. Mobilize the other thing. That will be for carrying and we shift. Now the console is running with battery. Battery back up. So now we can move. सोर्स ऑफ ऑक्सीजन सिलेंडर ऑक्सीजन स्मॉल ऑक्सीजन सिलेंडर एट द टाइम ऑफ शिफ्टिंग वी ऑलवेज एवर एनी किंकिंग और एनी ब्लीडिंग पेशेंट फुली रेस्टलेस वन मोर थिंग जस्ट वी आर जस्ट एक्सप्लेनिंग Bring the another setup. Just bring another setup. Just bring oh, the changing. Setup. Changing the oxygen. We are not doing it. Just uh, so we can uh, explain. So we bring the uh, another setup. Prepare another setup and uh, prime it. And just bring. This set is usually uh, placed at the remote uh, area where we are shooting the evening. So we are not uh, changing. Now. Just put, bring the another circuit with another console. Uh, just uh, simultaneously uh, start this circuit and start the other circuit and connect it. And uh, if we we'll regularly practice it, it is, it is required 10 to 15 second to uh, stop the circulation. We have to do simultaneously two people from this side. We can just cut it and connect it. Just uh, give some four five clamp. All we clamp using steroid, and also the supply also uh, relax seizures. Relax seizures. Relax seizures. Clamp it. Okay, okay. Some more clamp. Same to same way. Same to same way. Okay, okay. Ready, na clamp corona. Just, just, just. Rakho, rakho. Ready, kar, ready, kar, ready, ready, ready. Our our intensivist and our physician assistant and our uh, nurse, everybody uh, alert, hemodynamically, and we within 20 second we done it. So uh, it is the new circuit we will clamp and prepare uh, for next connection. It is ready. So somebody, our this side, can you ask? Sir, ask. Sir, ask. Oxygen change. Just hold. Just, just, just. So it is ready. So then, 
simultaneously we can clamp this line and change it. Okay, changing oxygenator is actually much more stressful than putting a new ECMO. Okay, that is the first thing because more or less in a stable patient you are changing the oxygenator. If the entire process takes little bit longer, sometimes patient undergoes in the arrest. Okay, so uh, normally we need to on uh, on both sides. Okay. You have to chalk out the plan where exactly you are going to cut and what you are going to do. Like in this patient, if we are planning to change the oxygenator, everything is ready. Okay, this is the. Uh, so these are the new. Just hold it. Can, uh, Just these are the new. Oh, achha, achha. This, this are the new uh, new circuit. So two clamps over here. Adrenaline connected okay. to the central axis. First, you have to change the ventilatory setting. Put the foot on 100%, increase the respiratory rate, okay. um, and uh, adjust the tidal volume. Clamps. This is the clamp, and this is just the clamp. Pull it. 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 रेडी क्लैम्पिंग जल जल रिज्यूम Ventilation. Ventilation all right. Ventilation settings. We will uh, change back to rest settings. One more connector. One more connector. Three, three connectors. Okay, sir. Clear. Clear. Okay. So most of the things we are able to cover. I hope. So jaw drain is one of the timely things. Yeah, hopefully not. Jaw drain. Okay. 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 Okay.
हेलो 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 ऑडियो क्लो तो लेवलिंग करा नहीं कौन देख हेलो 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 हाथ दो
fail any, any is there any query that you can uh, if you have some query then after that we are starting the cannulation part so we will have a cannulation uh, simulation here followed by the various case scenarios You have all uh, seen what are the various cannulas. Venous cannulas are longer with multiple holes. Arterial cannulas are smaller. Okay. Not many holes at the tip, but that is because it is mainly given for a return. Okay. Arterial cannula can also be used as a venous cannula for the jugular. And there is a double lumen cannula for VV ECMO with three holes, two for drainage, one is in the IVC and one is the SVC and the return will be directed towards the tricuspid. So cannulation can be for a venovenous ECMO, we have seen can be a femorojugular, first comes the drainage, femorojugular or it can be femorofemoral or it can be a dual lumen cannula from the IJB. Okay. And for the veno arterial ECMO, it can be femorofemoral, peripheral ECMO or central. VA ECMO can be peripheral or central. Commonly what we are discussing about the peripheral ECMO. Peripheral ECMO will be femorofemoral. That means we are draining from the femoral vein, the cannula tip going right up to the IVC or even in the RA and return it into the femoral artery. Okay, so this is the commonest uh, peripheral cannulation for VA ECMO. We can also cannulate the or surgically expose the axillary artery or the subclavian artery and we can put the cannula through a graft. So axillary or a subclavian cannulation is always surgical through a graft. So, these are the cannulation strategies. What is the size of the cannula that you will choose? will usually depend on the size of the patient. For an adult male, we usually choose the drainage cannula as 24 or 25. You can also go up to 29. But for the return, we use a smaller size cannula because it is the mainly the drainage cannula size which determines the our flow. If it is a smaller size drainage cannula, then we will not get adequate flow. So we use a larger size drainage cannula, a smaller size return cannula, which can be either 22 for the femoral, for even for neck we are using 18 or 20 size cannula. And for the femoral artery, we previously used to use a larger size cannulas, but they cause more of arterial occlusion. So we have come down to around 16, 15 or 16 size cannula, which give adequate flow. So size of the uh, cannula, uh, this is for the adults. For the pediatric, it depends upon the weight of the patient. There is algorithm chart which you can go through. <coughs> First, we will see the femoral venous cannulation. So all these cannulations are peripheral cannulations, and these are done by Seldinger technique.
this is the first thing. You have to locate the vein and then take a puncture. Use ultrasound if you are uh, using it regularly. Then put in a guide wire. After the guide wire is in, we serially dilate. Okay. And you can see we are cutting the skin one small nicks at a time so that the, uh, the sh dilators can go in smoothly. Okay, so pointer. So then, after serially dilating, we are putting the Are you clear? We put in first the guide wire, then the dial one size dilator, then serially dilated it larger, changed it to a larger guide wire, and then put this venous can cannula. This patient had already a central line here. We are exchanging it with the, with the neck jugular cannula. We have dilated it once. 
This is the dilator of the cannula. I am going to cannula. Do the cannula. So when you are putting the cannula in, always uh, railroad. And after the cannula is in, we have to flush the blood so that. So this the uh, dilator is in. You always need two persons for cannulation. One person it is difficult, but the other person has to help with the guide wires, with holding, otherwise it will be bleeding. Always be careful because the, for the jugular cannulation, the guide wire is smaller size. It should not come out. Now, you are putting the cannula with the dilator in. You can see how we are holding the cannula. The other person has to press the, the stilet forcefully inside. Otherwise, it will get pushed from the skin and it will not go in. And once the cannula is in, take out the dilator and the guide wire and you have to de, de, uh, you have to flush the blood out in, into the patient. So, so you are using hepsaline so that the blood is not clotting there. We usually give heparin after the cannulation is done. Some centers may use heparin after the guide wire is in, but it is safer to give heparin after the cannula is in. Otherwise, you may uh, face some injuries and at, after that, uh, if you have already given heparin, the patient will give bleed more. Okay. So this is the jugular venous cannulation. Last is the Arterial cannulation. This we are doing the distal perfusion cannulation first. We are putting the guide wire in. We you can see that the direction is downwards towards the leg. Direction of the needle is towards the leg. Now we are putting the guide wire for the femoral cannula. Puncture site acta upper acta niche due to direction alada, opposite direction. We are dilating the femoral artery. Yeah. 
do not force too much do not give too much of force otherwise if you are giving too much of force the guide wire may kink now we are putting the dilator and the cannula together in once it is in just take out the guide wire and now we are putting the distal perfusion cannula that is the sheath we are using we usually use a seven french sheath for this You can see that both the directions are opposite. This is going to the heart for the ECMO cannula. This is a distal perfusion for the leg. Now we'll come to a demonstration. Can we have the video on?
Guidance. Guide where? No? Smaller guide where? So, the guide wire is in. Now you have to just nick, give a small nick. Can I stand for? They, these are the dilators that we use. There is also a serial dilator which comes. Give the smallest one first. size of candle you are giving? 20. 16. 16. Now you use the dilator from the candle. And with every step you have to nick the skin. Going in free smoothly. The guide wire is coming in and out smoothly. Now, put this in. Pura, pura, pura. Before you put the guide uh, cannula, measure the length, how much it will go. Okay. How much we put in is from the puncture side up to the sternal angle. Okay. And there is a guard. It's around. 10 centimeter it will be. Angle of fluence. Yeah, angle of fluence. Be 
नीचे अंडरस्टैंड हाउ शी इज होल्डिंग शी इज फोर्सिंग द डायलेटेड इन सो दैट वेन यू वी आर पुशिंग इट इन द डायलेटेड विल नॉट कम आउट दिस इज इन नाउ वी नीड द क्लैम वी आर कमिंग आउट Clamp. Okay. And how you connect? Now we have to suture, fix the cannula. <coughs> the all cannulas have a reinforced part where where you should not clamp, and and a clear part. You should clamp only in the clear part. Funny. <coughs> Connecting to the line, uh, somebody has to put water. And see, there is it is a totally air-free connection. Understood? Now, when you want to go on pump, just you have to unclamp it. Fixing is here. One is here. Second is in the angle here. third is where you are connecting with the circuit three important fixation points for the cannula okay now once you have the cannula is in you have to give the happening okay okay so this any any queries go and sit Full cannulation means two cannulations. After the two cannulations, you give heparin. Okay. Any any more queries? Sir, when are we extending the longer blade? In the femoral, we usually extend it first. We are putting uh, the smaller can uh, guide wire in. First dilatation is inside. Keep the dilator in. Exchange it. Uh, with the say, longer dilate uh, this guide wire. Okay, so we use the triple lumen guide wire because it we are used to use it. It is quite stiff. It is easier to put it. Okay, and the after the first dilatation, you use the Tedimo guide wire. So next we will go into the simulation session.
Yes, absolutely. Don't go high up there. Don't go above the inguinal. हाँ ये हटा दो। So, uh, hope all of you can see the. You can see it. You can see it. This is a simulation session. Uh, so, after uh, day long. So, we'll uh, mimic few scenarios. And you have to volunteer. This time I am not the workshop manager. You are just uh, going to speak what is happening, this kind of scenarios. Okay. So these are all very basic scenarios we have kept because uh, the commonest things which happens are the day-to-day -day regular uh, management of ECMO we are concerned with. So uh, first with the patient. A patient we have put on... Uh, 24 year old man. Why are you changing so? Yeah, this is a 24 year old man weighing uh, 78 kg who has been admitted to your ICU for ongoing care. And six day history of increasing respiratory distress, fever, and productive cough. Doctor prescribed ampicillin, failed to improve. Shortly after into admission, deteriorated rapidly. Intubation, ventilation, H1N1. Positive, despite treatment, condition not improved, prone, permissive hypercarbia, inhaled nitric oxide, not improved. Next. So current blood gas analysis is PCO2 of 51, pH of 7.24, PO2 of 36, uh, after proning, and uh, saturation is 60. This is the X-ray. So you can see the uh, X-ray, very bad. Next. Almost all quadrants are involved. The decision is to... Uh, initiate the VV ECMO. Now, after putting the patient on VV ECMO, this is the ECMO console 
and this is the monitor. Okay. Uh, if you can see the monitor, okay, the hatch monitor to Halakur? The hatch. So I can tell you the what are the uh, parameters here. Uh, uh, those, she has mimicked the patient here also. Okay. Now look at these three are your uh, parameters. Okay. First is the ECMO console where flow is 3.7, your RPM is 3400, and uh, delta P is 18. What is delta P? Yeah. Yeah. The delta P is acceptable, that means oxygenator is working. Your saturation, uh, venous saturation is 71, it's fine. Uh, temperature is 36.4, I know, temperature on the venous side is 36.4. So this is the ECMO parameters, okay. Uh, the monitor shows heart rate of 60, blood pressure of 122 by 59, they have a uh, PA catheter which is 40 by 21, CVP is 8 and the saturation is 64. Okay. Before putting the patient on ECMO, the saturation was 81. Okay. After putting the patient on ECMO, uh, this is the parameters and the saturation is 64. So I am the patient relative. I want to ask, please, One of you volunteers. What is the thing is happening? Somebody of you has to uh, no. Defi define the scenario and tell me what is the problem. Any problem? A is a patient. A is a ECMO parameter. A is a monitor. Okay. Is problem? As far as monitor is concerned, uh, uh, parameters is concerned, uh, there's not much of hemodynamic disturbance, but, but the problem is unable to achieve the saturations. Okay. So, uh, what should be the cause of the saturation? Or if you want to change something to increase the saturation or something, what is your diagnosis? Why the saturation is not being uh, I can increase uh, fl uh, flow if you I can. You want to increase flow. Okay. So you want to increase flow. So, um, huh? flow is increased. Flow, flow is increased. Flow is increased. Uh, we have increased the RPM to 4000. Flow has gone up to 4.3. Saturation is 64. Now slowly coming down to 58. The increasing flow. So uh, I am uh, looking to echo, there's any LV dilatation or so something like that. So you want to see the echo to uh, the LV dilatation. Echo seen, echo is, ejection fraction is 65%, no LV dilatation, uh, uh, good contractility is found, no uh, valvular abnormalities, uh, diastole dysfunction, grade 1. And then I look for the any LV chattering or the look for hypovolemia. Okay, hypovolemia, there is no chattering. Because if you can see that your uh, venous side pressure is minus 36, you know our accepted venous side pressure is should be less than minus 40. So there is no chattering is happening. Anything you want to know? Okay, FiO2 we want to increase. Which FiO2 want to increase? FdO2. FdO2 want to increase. FDO2 is already 100%. You want to check anything more? Connection of the oxygen? Connection of the oxygen you want to check? You want to check? Okay, it is well connected and until source it is found the oxygen is connected. Huh? No, no, no clamp. No clamp. Flow is fine. Flow is four level, almost 4 liter. He has increased the now the saturation has gone up, gone down, uh, further in, with increasing in RPM. Patient, patient is, patient was little bit of struggling. We have paralyzed him and now he is not, no, no movement, 
is paralyzed, is properly sedated, and blood pressure is maintained at around 122 by 59. Color difference of the venous and arteries. So this is the patient. This is the uh, color difference. Uh, uh, this is the color of the venous and arterial line. This is the patient. So probably there is answer resuscitation. Okay. So, here you have to see there is no color difference. Okay. That means what is happening? It is the recirculation is happening. That's why we have not been able to increase the saturation. Once he has gone up in the RPM, the recirculation increased much more. Because as the uh, two cannulas are in proximity, you want to, uh, there is a uh, decrease in the, again, the uh, oxygen saturation. Now, what, what is your next plan? How you are going to plan it? Uh, first of all, uh, how will you increase the saturation? Now? First of all, I have to do the uh, x-ray and okay. uh, look for the two cannula differences. Okay. How more, much it should be? should be more than 10 centimeters. More than 10 centimeters. And so look at the, 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 she has already shown it. Ideally, the color difference should be like this. This is the drainage cannula and this is the return cannula. Okay. Now the color difference has become this. Okay, the recirculation is usually happens, but if it is more than 30%, it becomes clinically evident. Okay, then what will happen that both the uh, uh, drainage and the return cannula will turn red. Okay, so more you suck, more you increase the RPM, it will suck the oxygenated blood more and decrease the saturation. So. Consult a So, what are the points to consider? The position of the cannulas, we have to uh, keep it apart. Immediately, what we can do is what we'll do? Consult. What, what, uh, what we have done to increase the saturation? Decrease the RPM. We have decreased the RPM. Okay, just the saturation has gone up to 76, which has not been able to go up more than 60. So this is a scenario of, so these three you have to see simultaneously to get that. Okay, any questions for this? We'll wrap it up, okay. After all the scenarios, we'll wrap it up, the scenarios. So don't see single parameter, always see as a whole. You have to see the patient. You have to see the monitor, you have to see the ABGs, you have to see the console. Now, to push our next scenario. Okay, that I will tell you, black box. This way. And the next scenario. Okay. Is the same patient? Okay, same patient. Okay, same patient. After getting a good, um, uh, this thing, patient is running well and uh, what is happening now? Can anybody volunteer? I can be volunteer. You want to volunteer? You don't want to. Please, please come. Please come. High volume is the same. I can't say. Who are you? Tell me. Two or three things. If you ask something, you will get a lot of trouble. Just tell me why you are telling it's high volume. What are the things? CVP is decreased. High. CVP. Okay. Fine. And then high. Yeah. All my extra pressures are. Okay. So, it's normal that CP5 is not a hypovolemia. So, what do you think is a hypovolemia? Why are you telling it is a hypovolemia? Because there is a scenario. What is the problem in the monitor? Tell me. What is the, first, tell me the, what is the problem in the monitor. The flow is at 20 liters per minute. Okay. And then with IPM 2800. Okay. And then the delta B is 30. Okay. And the P-actual is a mean actual pressure is 36. Mean actual pressure is? Mean actual is 72. 72, okay. So that's fine, just go back. So you don't want to see the chat. So what is the problem? Why you want to address it as a... Yeah, start.
Saturation just going down. Saturation is 25, and patient is having bradycardia. So what are you going to do? You have to still want to check the cannula, or do want to do something? What we do when ch some chattering happens? Basic thing. You, what is your diagnosis? Inadequate venous. Inadequate venous drainage. So what are the causes of inadequate venous fluid? So first thing is you give fluid. Okay. Second thing, what we do, we reduce what we have done. Exactly, we do the opposite thing. We reduce the RPM so that this negative suction doesn't happen much. So the IVC gets some open and you get get some venous drainage. So give immediate reaction is to give fluid. Okay. Second is reduce the RPM. If it is not improving on that, if your flow is not increasing or your negative suction is not increasing, then you have to check the position of the thing. In, in between, patient is struggling or patient is uh, moving and all this thing, you have to C keep it serious. Okay, so this is the scenario. Don't uh, put the name of the thing, hypovolumetry is not like that. Check the individual parameters and then you uh, address it. Okay, please sit. Okay, next. Ricky. Next. Okay. Now this patient is having uh, 14 days of ECMO run, okay, he or she is doing well and we are planning to come down on ECMO, uh, her oxygen saturation is slowly increasing, lung is getting better. Now one fine morning we found this kind of parameters. Can anybody uh, volunteer please? Saturation is 72. Problem is 14 days. Okay, the patient is very good. 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 Okay, R 
reposition your venous cannula to do that. Next is again, last one, the blood flow, change in cardiac output. Suddenly on ECMO, your patient is become febrile. Patient was fine with a 4 liter of flow when his cardiac output was 5 liter. Suddenly he became febrile or your uh, hemothermia is not working. Suddenly he became a 104 fever. His cardiac output suddenly went up to 10 liters. And your flow remains 4 liters. What will happen? You will have hypoxia. Then, so there is any change in cardiac output, there is any fever, there is a new sepsis which has come or patient is struggling, patient is awake, patient is uh, uh, moving or patient is extremely tachycardic. These are the things. Again, next, if it is after uh, correcting all the things, if it is not improving, then you go to the patient to see any change in ventilation or any new pneumothorax or any lung collapse has developed which is hampering the uh, the lung, uh, the uh, participation of the lung in the oxygenation that is hampering on the lung. Okay, so this checklist you can take a photograph just to check when the patient on VV echo as a morning checklist that these are the things are fine or not. Would I get a photo? Can you ask a question? First is the color difference present or not. Okay, this will, the first question will exclude recirculation. Okay. Next is oxygen delivery to the oxygenator. Oxygen connection is garbara chiki na, blender is garbara chiki na, oxygenator of the source oxygen pooncho chiki na. Okay. Connected and running from the oxygen cylinder and checking connections blender at one. Now, third one is the oxygenator function. Post oxygenator gas dekho, athwa delta P bedhe ga chiki na, that will decide the hypoxia. Is there any, next is, egulo correct hoye gele, is there any access insufficiency? Line ta chhoto ache ki na or patient is hypovolemic, we need to give some volume, chattering ho chiki na to increase the flow. Tar kore jodhi na hai, blood flow kato ache, if the blood flow has to increase or there is a mismatch of the patient's cardiac output and the uh, how much flow we are giving. If the patient cardiac output has gone up, you have to take down on the patient's cardiac output. If those things are fine, then even then the hypoxia is persisting, you have to check the patient's lung which is participating some amount of oxygenation has that part has gone down because of a large pneumothorax or something else. So this is the flow chart or basic checks we do when we assess a patient of VV ECMO on regular basis. So I will give you round of the 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 round. So these five questions Rather, six questions will help you the ECMOTA amount, tick tack chul check in and patient is doing okay or not. What is the last point? What is the native lungs contribute? Egulo jeta hoya chhe jay, amandar arashwa dhaka jay jay, patient prothom dhikhe atara shamashra hai na, kodat dhikhe jokhun starts improving, tika chha, arashwa hai na, tar kodai nyumotra arashwa develop kodai. Then amandar dhekhaan jay hoya saturation bar chhe, 95-96 hoya gachi, we are thinking of coming down. So at that, that point of time, we have started generating large tidal volumes, which we have seen in COVID and all these things. Suddenly, the pneumothorax happens. Okay. So, lung jeta contribute to this part, this part is getting out. So, again, you have a hypoxia, which is only an ECMO-dependent part. So, these are the basic checks we do every day for an ECMO patient to uh, whether they are doing the machine is working or not. So, these three are the scenarios for VVA. Now, coming to the VA. Ah, okay, yeah, this is the 
Any more questions in your mind you can ask? रोल नहीं
circuit with crystal but if there is no hand crank there is no pump we have only a heart lung machine with with the heart lung machine perfectionist know how to prime it without any pump we done it by gravitational we can done it by gravitational because air always move to upwards and fluid always downwards we can do it in, in the emergency situation but now we have another backup console so we always used by backup console so our backup console primed and circulated same way when we are doing cannulating is same way new line holder and towel clip attached parallelly and we process this line with the help of our physician assistant two physician assistant they taking our line and kept here and already secure this line by the towel clip and circulated already 
clamped from perfusion inside both line. Okay, sir. But we, now we are not put on clamp our connected circuit. Now we are ready and we measure the length according to our previous circuit. Suppose our return line, both are color red. But this here. So you see this length is appropriate for this length. Because we don't in, uh, need uh, much length or do we, we don't need short length. As it has previous circuit. So we needed both clamp for here and drainage for both clamp here. Clear? So we ready with one clamp, one another clamp, one clamp, another clamp. Before this, ventilator setting increases and some drug, emergency drug is prepared, may happen, arrest. So, we all ready. Now our intensive is set, order, everything is ready, seizures ready, fluid filled with 20 ml syringe, also ready. Then, one, two, three, we put clamp. Both line, both line, and here we cut it, scissor, cut it, scissor, and they also we cut it here and connect it. Clear, sir? Then thoroughly we just open our venous line first, then we open arterial line. But all pump always above. 1500 rpm. Minimum. Our prime after prime, we always kept it 1500 rpm because may be backflow arises. We don't allow it. And we started same to same pump flow to oxygen flow and we kept our pre pump rpm and LPM and oxygen setting and ventilator setting. Any question? Air chance Air Janaka chance. Practice make perfect. And 20 ml syringe is important. 20 ml syringe is important. What happened? We started 2014 with one oxygenator, one heart lung machine. Now we are running minimum 20, 30. No problem. We can change it in ambulance. We can change in maybe air also. Because our student, our uh, perfectionist, they know, they don't try to give any air in our circuit. So it is we depend on practice. So one more question after a lot of things, which is important? Which is important? The decision, timing, priming, cannulating, maintaining, what is important the whole ECMO circuit? Decision. Whole everything decision. Apni decision. Another. Now nah, here is no all of above, only one. Servolution timing. Maintain. RQ. RQ. I have given option timing, priming, cannulating, maintaining, winning. What is the main thing? Timing. Priming. Timing. 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 We are the perfectionist. I am challenging. If you give me a patient with arrested proper cannulating, we can run the ECMO. So after all of my experience with my Devalala or others, cannulating is the main thing 
for continuing it more. So our all doctors or intensivists, I am requesting to interest your aim proper cannulating. Then perfusionist will do the job. Cannulating the kick tack or the lesser shop jagger shop kitchen. Idam, 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 to train junior intensivist, multiple puncture, we go on pump, neck with swelling, neck with swelling. We are giving fluid. Sorry. So cannulating is very important. Thing. One thing, sir, madam, team is very important. कोई भी अकेला नहीं कर सकता है। Need good intensivist, specialist, and management also. Our infrastructure also. At the time of pandemic, we purchased uh, five centrifuges within one hour. We have no stand, we have no trolley, we arrange it. So we need manpower also.
So you have a patient, 25, 25 years. Can you see the question? 60 year old male patient, a 60 kg male patient, 25 years. Having fever, breathlessness, drowsy, and was diagnosed with ARDS, put on ventilator. Okay. PF ratio is gradually decreasing to PF ratio is gradually decreased to less than 150. And now you have decided to prone the patient. In spite of proning, the PF ratio is coming down. The patient was sedated, paralyzed, and hemodynamics maintained. Okay. What ventilator setting you keep on PCV, PEEP of 10, FiO2 of 100%, you have gone up to 100% and frequency of 35. So you have gone up to maximum ventilation settings with that. And in spite of that, the PO2 is coming down to 45. So PF ratio is low. PCO2 gone up to 68. Lactate is 3.6. Given antibiotics, ECO is showing normal heart and there is no coagulopathy. What will you do? This is the x-ray. So, PF ratio is less than 50. PCO2 is rising. You are on maximum ventilatory support. The only way you have already proned you cannot go up on the ventilation anymore. So the next stage is for ECMO, VV ECMO or V ECMO, which one? VV ECMO. You need to support the lungs. So the patient is placed on VV ECMO and in a femorojugular fashion, cannulation. Okay. And you are generating a flow of 3.8 liters. You put the patient, after the putting the patient on ECMO, you make the ventilator setting to rest ventilator setting. Okay. You paralyze, sedate and paralyze, and start heparin and shift the patient to your center. So you have initiated ECMO elsewhere. You cannot shift that patient without putting on ECMO. This is one thing you have to remember. You will get many patients who are in different hospitals who will be referred it is very difficult to shift those very sick patients if you do not take care of the oxygenation. Once you have taken care of the oxygenation, you can easily shift the patient back to your own hospital. Once in your ICU, you see that his saturation is again started to fall. Okay. So why the saturation is you are on VV ECMO? What are the causes of hypoxia on VV ECMO? Already you are on VV ECMO, you should have an adequate saturation at least more than 85%. That is our target. But now you are seeing that the saturation is less than that. So what do we want to do? What are the possible causes of hypoxia on VV ECMO? First and foremost, you have to see whether the oxygen connection is there, connect properly or not. So you see the color difference. Okay, if you have a proper color difference, your oxygen is going into the membrane oxygenator. And if the two colors are bright, that means there is a recirculation. Okay, so there itself you will rule out many other things. So color, pos possible color difference, uh, uh, the proper color difference of should be there changing yes ye complete ho jane do So you assess the whether the oxygen connection is proper or not, color difference is proper or not, whether the patient is now, what are the other causes? What are the other causes of hypoxia on VV ECMO? 
patient is restless and awake. He can be awake but restless. If the patient is restless, the flow will come down. If the patient is restless, then the oxygen requirement goes up. Okay, so that is another cause. What are the other causes? Venous? Venous access. That means you are getting, not getting adequate flow. Okay. So, how much should be the flow? It is said that you should have at least 60% of your cardiac output should be coming to the circuit. Okay. VV ECMO, not all the venous return is coming to the circuit. Only part of the venous return is coming to the circuit. So, suppose if the patient is going into sepsis, the cardiac output increases. Previously, the patient's cardiac output was 7 liters. You are on 4.5 liters of flow. So 4.5 liters of oxygenated blood is mixing with 2.5 liters of deoxygenated blood and there is a mixing in the RA. Now, patient go on into sepsis. Cardiac output went up to 10 liters. You are still on 4.5 liters flow. So 4.5 liters of this oxygenated blood is mixing with 5.5 liters of your deoxygenated blood. So there will be, for with the mixing effect, the hypoxia will be there. So if there is a cardiac output increase, if the patient is agitated, if there is a recirculation, uh, recirculation ho gaya? Scenario ho gaya na? If the oxygen connection is not there, all these things you have to rule out. Okay. So next... So remember, this is a very common scenario that you are getting a hypoxia. Recirculation, you have to, if, if the patient is in sepsis, you have to go up on the flow and also you sometimes we come down on the temperature to 35, 35.5 in VV ECMO. Why? To reduce the basal metabolic rate, to reduce the CO2 output so that your oxygen requirement comes down, you have adequate supply of oxygen. V ECMO? So you have put the, suppose the patient, you got a patient in cardiogenic shock, had an MI, you have put the patient on VECMO, you have done the revascularization that was needed and now after five days, uh, you are finding the cardiac output when uh, the cardiac function is gradually increasing. Patient was awake, but you come the next day morning, you find the patient drowsy. S where do we measure the saturation in VA ECMO? Right index finger. So you find the saturation to be around 80. Okay. X-ray you have done, X-ray you see that there is a large mnemonic patch. Patient has developed a VAP. Okay. But there is a good pulsatility in the arterial trace. Native VTI has improved. Okay. So that means the cardiac function is improving but you are getting a low saturation in your index finger. PF ratio is down. What can be your possible causes of this? And how do you explain this phenomenon? Your heart has improved, but your saturation is going down. And what can be the cause of this? You are on ECMO. You are on ECMO. The flows have remained stable. 
it has not gone up or down. So this is a kind of Harlequin. What is a Harlequin? Harlequin or Nautsau syndrome or this is where two criteria needs to be fulfilled. This occurs only in VAFO. One is your cardiac function should have improved and second your lung function should be poor. These two things if it is there then it is occurring. Why it is occurring? Because the venous return that is coming to the right heart partly is going through the oxidator into the femoral artery. Okay. But part of the venous return is also going to the lungs. And since the lungs is not taking part into the oxygenation of this blood, this blood is reaching the left heart. Okay, so the left heart, once it, the function has improved, it is ejecting this blood. And what are the proximal arteries that are there? The proximal artery is the coronaries and the carotids. Okay, right, right side it is supplying both the arm and the brain and the left is the carotid and then the subclavian. So the proximal vessels will be getting the blood which is getting ejected from the left ventricle. And that ventricular blood is deoxygenated because the lung is not taking part into the gaseous exchange. But the other parts of the body which are getting blood from the ECMO, they are getting oxygenated blood. Now if what we can do, what, what you can do in this situation, what, why it was not there before and why it has, it has developed now. That is because previously the heart was not ejecting properly and all the femoral arterial blood that is the ECMO blood was supplying the whole of the body. Now the heart has started to eject. So there is a opposing flow between the heart and the ECMO blood flow and there occurs a mixing depending upon the force of each. Okay. So we come to the case. Here we will see the scenario and how we treat it. So the 42 year old male patient, uh, he developed acute onset of chest pain that is MI developed, ECG anterior wall MI and the patient crashed, developed uh, unstable uh, cardiac rhythms and went for emergency angioplasty, shifted to a ICU but was not responding even with the high dose of vasopressors. And then the patient was on, was having metabolic acidosis, lactate rising, whatever the tissue perfusion is not adequate in spite of your revascularization and high dose of vasopressors and inotropes. So your ABG is showing a lactate of 5.3, it has gone up. Acidosis minus 13.4, okay. And PO2 is around 75. Now what next? So you have to plan for a mechanical circulatory support. Okay, VA ECMO is a form of mechanical circulatory support. You have to plan for a mechanical circulatory support. Primarily, many centers will be, if the VA ECMO is not there, they will be giving an IABP. Here we have a VA ECMO. We can go for uh, this uh, VA ECMO. Or if you have an impella, you can go for an impella. But VA ECMO is usually preferred because it can support both the right and left heart and it can also oxygenate blood. And the cost of VA ECMO is one fourth or one fifth of the impella. So you decide to go on VA ECMO. What are the cannulation si sites you will choose? Usually the peripheral cannulation sites, femoral vein you will be choosing and femoral artery. Okay. And also you have to give a distal perfusion cannula. Give heparin to maintain the anticoagulation and then next 
So you have placed the patient on VA ECMO with a femoral venous 21 French, return is 19 French femoral artery, and distal perfusion with a 7 French cannula. Next. So this is the flow. Next. You can see the direction of the cannula. Is it visible to all of you? It's a very good uh, yeah, documentation. See, both the cannulation sites near the skin are side by side. But inside, the femoral arterial cannula is up. The distal perfusion cannula is lower down. OK. So you are on flow of 2.1 liters. If the patient is having an hypotension on VA ECMO, what can you do? What are the things that you have to think of? You have already already on VA ECMO. So the perfusion, whether you may measure the perfusion pressure or you measure the flow, on which tissue perfusion? Okay. Pressure is 95 by 60. It is okay. Mean pressure of 72. I am happy with it. Okay. Now, PCOT is 45. You may need to go up on the sweep gas. CVP is 8. Saturation of 88. This is on VA ECMO. It should be going up higher. That means if this is in the right hand, in a VA ECMO, you should have a saturation which is higher. If this is in the right hand, then the patient is having a harlequin. If the saturation in the right hand is low. Okay. <coughs> so, what are the things that you can do if the patient is having a harlequin? If the patient is having a harlequin, that means the heart has improved. So, you have to think about coming off the arterial support, but you cannot come off directly. Okay. So, for temporary means you can go up on the ECMO flow so that the brain circulation will be maintained because if you keep the brain with a hypoxic blood for a longer time, it will fry out. So, you have to maintain cerebral circulation with oxygenated blood properly. But that is not a proper solution because as we go up on the flow, it will increase the afterload and again the, it will increase the afterload of the heart. The heart will not improve further. So what we do is we have to increase the oxygenation of the blood which is coming to the left side. So we go up on the ventilatory settings. We make it 100% oxygen. We increase the PEEP. Okay. So that our blood which is returning to the left side of the heart is partially oxygenated. If that is not occurring properly, then you have to think of triple cannulation. Why, what is triple cannulation? That is you divide the, uh, the arterial return into two parts. One is going to the artery, the other is going into the jugular vein. You can see in the board, previous slide. The return blood is di being divided into arterial system to supply the circulation. The another part will be going to the venous system. Why? Because then your part of the blood which is coming to the left side of the heart will get oxygenated. <coughs> okay. So the mixed blood in the RA will not be a very low saturation it will have some oxygenation. So even if the lungs is not functioning properly, you the left heart gets oxygenated blood and its ejection blood to the carotids, to the coronaries, it will be oxygenated blood. So you go for a triple cannulation strategy because the lungs are bad. Okay, you have to assess whether in, on x-ray the lungs are bad, airway pressures are going up, 
and your saturation in your right index finger is going down. These are the three things that you have to assess. And once you are on triple cannulation strategy with a VAV, then you gradually, what happens? There's a flow, one side in the arterial system is the afterload is high, the other is the venous system, the afterload is low. So major blood will be going to the venous system. So you have to put a clamp in the venous return line so that pa only part of the blood will be going into the right atrium. Majority will be going to the femoral artery. And once the cardiac function has improved further, you gradually come down on the VA flow and go up on the VV flow. That is, you release the clamp from in the jugular and clamp, start clamping the arterial side. Okay. All these machines have two probes. You can put the two probes on the two different limbs of return. One from the arterial, one is the venous. And you see how much is the ratio. If the cardiac function is improved and where you are winning of the VA, you gradually increase the clamp in the venous cannula and reduce the flow there. And once the cannula, cannula is fully clamped and the patient is stable, then you can take out the arterial cannula and keep the patient on VV till the lungs do not improve. Once the lung is improved, then you can take off the ECMO. So what you have to see is that LV function is improved or not. If there is any de remaining LV dysfunction, you have to wait. How much is the lung function there? What is the compliance, whether it is totally white out or not? Is the white out because of pneumonia or because of the increased fluid overload? So if it is due to increased fluid overload, if you give diuretics, then it will improve. Okay. So we are titrating the ventilator setting, LV venting, okay, it is titrating the ECMO flow in each limb and VAV ECMO. Next. Khatam. So you do, this is a complex scenario. Our first initial case, the patient improved on the third day. We thought we'll keep for one more day. And the next day morning when we came, the patient already was drowsy. We didn't understand at that time what was happening. But after that, when we analyzed that the patient developed Harlequin in the night, it was went undiagnosed for a few hours and the patient had a stroke after that. Okay. Any questions? Differential flow wave data to? Part of the venous flow. Part of the venous flow. Part of the venous flow. ঠিক আছে এটা হফম্যান টিউবিন ক্ল্যাম্প বা আমরা অনেক সময় এমনি যে ক্ল্যাম্পগুলো তো দেখেছেন व्हाट एवर यू हैव सीन दोस ক্ল্যাম্পস ইউ পুট ইট পার্শিয়ালি ওকে সো দ্যাট দা ফ্লো ইন দা ভেনাস লিম গোজ ডাউন দা ভেনাস লিম হ্যাজ নো আফটার লোড সো ইফ ইউ ডিভাইড মেজর ব্লাড উইল গো ইনটু দা ভিভি সার্কিট এন্ড ভেরি লেস উইল গো ইনটু দা ভিএ সার্কিট সো উই বাট উই नीड ভিএ ফ্লো মোর সো উই ক্ল্যাম্প দা ভেনাস রিটার there is there is a picture there i'll show you certificate session korbo kothay এখানে করবে
going to the femoral artery. The other part is going to the neck. One part is going to the femoral artery. The other part is through the Y going to the neck. So if you have exhausted all your resources to increase the flow and the patient is still remaining hypoxic and you want a higher flow, then you have to put in another drainage cannula, second drainage cannula. Dialysis can be done from the circuit or you can put in a separate line. Okay. From the circuit, I'll show you. You have to take blood. You can take blood from any part of the circuit. But you have to give it back pre-membrane. Because any air or clot coming from the dialysis circuit will get into the membrane. It will not pass it into the patient. You can take blood from any pa pa portion of the circuit, but return is always pre-membrane. Dialysis HOV. Uh, any queries then uh, before we go into the next final session we can take the certificates okay certificates uh, Shoibal We are providing the certificate. Come, call the one. Now, Miss, calling them. Okay. Okay. Sir, Doctor Dr. Obijit Dash. Yes, Obijit Dash, Dr. Onirban Chattopadhyay. Ms. Preeti Shaha. 
मिस आदित्य सतपति प्रीति 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 शाह आदित्य शतपति डॉक्टर शुभदीप माइती डॉक्टर संशय महापात्र शुभदीप माइती डॉक्टर संशय महापात्र रंजन कुमार मेहर डॉक्टर सुप्रीम साधु खा लाइट प्रशांत वर्मा प्रशांत वर्मा प्रशांत रंजन बेहरा डॉक्टर प्रशांत वर्मा फर्स्ट हाँ डॉक्टर प्रशांत रंजन बेहरा नेक्स्ट इज मिस्टर प्रसन्नजीत सिंह मिस्टर प्रसन्नजीत सिंह या मिस्टर अनिर्बान चंदो नेक्स्ट मिस्टर स्वराज कुमार दे नेक्स्ट डॉक्टर अनिता राज मल्लिक डॉक्टर अनिता राज मल्लिक डॉक्टर संदीप कुमार मंडल नेक्स्ट डॉक्टर देवोत्तम गंगोपाध्याय नेक्स्ट डॉक्टर प्रणव दुबे डॉक्टर प्रणव दुबे डॉक्टर अर्क प्रभु सिंह रॉय नेक्स्ट इज डॉक्टर अनिरुद्ध सरकार डॉक्टर शुभदीप्त पानीग्राही
Mr. Anamul Ansari. Mr. Vashif Jaman Rehman, next. Sir. Mr. Vashif Jaman Rehman. Mr. Shouri Mojumdar. Shouri. Dr. Liton Sharkar, Dr. Liton Sharkar, Dr. Shagnik Dash, next. Sir, sir, sir. Dr. Shagnik Dash, Dr. Bijoy B.S. Rajan Dash. Mr. Shujan Shao, Mohammad Rizwanullah, yes. Mr. Chandondeep Ghosh next, Mr. Shukalan Maiti, Mr. Shukalan Maiti next. Dr. Ye Koko Hetet. I hope I pronounced it right. Dr. Luin. Dr. Pailin. Dr. May. Dr. Shubhankar Bhomik. Dr. Shubhankar Bhomik. Dr. Vishnu Padho Jana next. Dr. Priya Singh. 